our brothers and sisters from other traditions. And we are happy also to count on the auspices of the Dicaster for Promoting Christian Unity, which is uh, the department of the Catholic Church that is in charge of relations with other Christians at world level. Now let us hear the words of Cardinal Kurt Koch. Your Excellencies, Your Graces, Reverend Sisters, dear professors, dear students, dear participants, I'm pleased to greet you all at the beginning of the International Ecumenical Conference Listening to the West, Synodality according to Anglican, Lutheran, Reformed, Methodist and Old Catholic traditions. This very week, during a press conference on the presentation of the prayer event at the beginning of the Synod next October, a journalist asked, can the Catholic Church learn something on synodality from the other Christian communities and confessions? I wish he could attend the various ecumenical conferences on the topic organized by the Institute for Ecumenical Studies of the Angelicum. Indeed, a change of attitude is necessary in order to examine our own faithfulness to Christ's will for the Church and accordingly to undertake with vigor the task of renewal and reform as proposed by the decree on ecumenism. For sure, synodality is not a new ecclesial reality, neither it has been lived in the same way by all Christian traditions. Different circumstances, ecclesial developments and theologies has resulted in different synodal approaches from the different traditions through the centuries. Synodality is a challenge for the church of our times. And as Catholics, we wish to explore the different synodal approaches of our brothers and sisters in an attitude of listening. It is our firm conviction that what the Holy Spirit has sown in you is also a gift for us. Therefore, attentive listening, authentic spiritual discernment and avoiding self-reference attitudes are key if we wish this exercise will succeed in order to strengthen in our Christian witness in the world as evangelizers fearlessly open to the working of the Holy Spirit. In expressing my best wishes for this first part of the symposium, listening to the West, I would like to express my deep appreciation to the Institute for Ecumenical Studies of the Angelicum for this academic initiative at the service of the whole church and my gratitude for the close collaboration with the General Secretariat of the Synod, represented here by Sister Natalie Becar and the Secretary. Allow me finally to express my heartfelt thanks to all those who will enrich this conference with their own expertise and qualified papers. Unfortunately, I cannot stay with you during the conference. I wish I could attend all the deliberation and listen personally all your presentations. Nevertheless, I will not miss to read the conclusion and the proceeding at the end of these three days of reflection. In this sense, I wish you a good listening to the West. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Eminence. Certainly, all these conferences are in the spirit of being evangelizers. We do not want just to listen to one another, but we wish to be a church, one that could announce the gospel together. And this listening to the West is inspired on the proposal of the Synod for the process of the Catholic Church. And the first one was to listen in. 
And now we would like to have the word of the under secretary of our Synod, Sister Natalie Becca. Please. Thank, thank you. Your Eminence, Your Excellencies, Your Grace, dear whole brothers and sisters in Christ, it's really uh, wonderful to be here with you in the name of the Secretariat of the Synod and especially on Cardinal Gregg, the General Secretary. And just at the end of this week of prayer for unity, as the Catholic Church is experiencing this process called usually Synod on Synodality, and as we are now uh, in the continental stage of the Synod after the diocesan and national phase, it's really a true gift to journey together through this event and as Catholic to have this opportunity to listen to the West and to listen to the experience of synodality according to Anglican, Lutheran, Reform, Methodist, and all Catholic traditions. So first, I really want uh, to thank and to humbly uh, appreciate uh, all those who have contributed and will contribute to this timely international ecumenical conference. Uh, His Eminence Karl Kor and Cardinal Kor and the Dicastery for Promoting Christian Unity, with whom our Secretariat for the Synod has developed wonderful collaboration since the preparation of the Synod and all along uh, the past. And moreover, I want also to thank in advance all those who have prepared a paper and who have decided to participate here, be it in person or online. A conference like this is not possible without those who see the many practical aspects and uh, I also, we are very grateful for the support and the organization from um, Pro Oriente and also the Angelicum, the Institute for Ecumenical Studies, especially Father Yacent de Stivel and uh, Monsignor Juan Usman Gomez. So as we begin here, I would like to remind uh, a few words from Pope Francis yesterday at the Vespers uh, on this feast of the conversion of St. Paul with uh, many Christians from uh, different churches. And Pope Francis said, how beautiful it is to open ourselves together under the sign of the Spirit's grace to this change of perspective, rediscovering that all the faithful scattered throughout the world are in communion with one another in the Holy Spirit and in this way, as John Chrysostom wrote. On this path of communion, I am grateful, said Pope Francis yesterday, that many Christians from different communities and traditions are accompanying with participation and interest the synodal journey of the Catholic Church, which I hope will become increasingly ecumenical. But let us not forget that walking together and recognizing that we are in communion with one another in the Holy Spirit implies a change, a growth um, that can only take place also from uh, the start of prayer. So really for us, this path is a path of conversion and we need each other, um, and we hope that through this listening, especially during this conference, listening to your experience, the Catholic Church will continue to listen to the Holy Spirit, and we will continue this path of unity uh, with this idea, as Pope Francis has reminded us uh, recently, that there is no synodality without ecumenism and no ecumenism without uh, synodality. And we really experience through the first conferences and all this past how uh, fostering these relationships with other churches and listening to them 
is really a laboratory of synodality and uh, a blessed time to continue our journey together. So I wish you also uh, and us a very interesting and fruitful conference. I am also sorry because I have to go back now immediately for a meeting with Pope Francis, but I will come back uh, to continue to, to listen to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sister Natalie. I think it is important to remind you what is our methodology, our program these days. Our methodology, as it is in the program, is first to have a keynote address by one, of the, by, by one representative of the five traditions we are going to hear. After that keynote address, we will have, we will have um, a listener, a Catholic listener, who is going to uh, help us to understand for the first time what is the possible learnings for the Catholic Church. That we will start with all the four traditions and after that we will have a panel in which three persons will speak about historical, juridical, and pastoral approach to synodality according to his, his or her own tradition. I am very pleased to remind you that we are also having the, the presence among us of important leaders of the communities. And we would like to thank them very much because they are going to have not only the presentations, but they will also accept it to moderate our following uh, sessions. So we are going to have little by little some of them, but I, I like to thank all of them to be able to be with us and to give a sign, a clear sign of what is the listening and what is being in synodality with the Catholic Church. Perhaps we start in, in two minutes and before starting, I think we can again uh, pray together by singing what we start to sing. In the meantime, I call to the floor uh, Bishop, Archbishop Ian Ernst and Professor Paul Avis. <laughs> Just a word of welcome to Archbishop Ian Ernest, which is the director of the Anglican Center in Rome. He is also the personal representative of the Archbishop of Canterbury. It is important for us to have not only relations of communion, but also moments of reflection, and we are really pleased that you accepted to be with us as the moderator of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Usma. Good morning to you all. Your Eminence, uh, distinguished bishops, reverend fathers, reverend sisters, and dear friends, I wish as I lead uh, this first session of this International Ecumenical Symposium to express my profound appreciation to the organizing committee for providing me the opportunity and privilege to be part of this august gathering of brothers and sisters from different churches as we are to reflect during the next three days on voices that we shall hear from the West regarding the synodal process initiated by the Holy Father, Pope Francis. 
This is indeed a laudable initiative, and I'm very thankful to the Institute for Ecumenical Studies for organizing such an ecumenical colloquium, which has at its heart an objective of cultivating, as it was said earlier, the desire to listen to the other. I do hope that uh, the present discussion I am moderating will enable us to provoke and to activate our thinking when it comes to reflect on the needed structures of the church as it reaches out to the world with a spirit of togetherness. I have now the great pleasure of inviting the keynote speaker for this session, representing the voice of the Anglican Communion, Reverend Professor Paul Avis from the University of Edinburgh, as he is going to speak on the topic, Synodality and Anglicanism. Professor Avis is widely known and respected in the world of ecumenical thinking and dialogue. He is the author of several books on different themes and more especially on Anglican polity. I have now the pleasure of inviting you, Reverend Professor Paul Avis, to give us a paper of this conference. Thank you. It is a great uh, privilege and pleasure for me to participate uh, in this consultation or colloquium, I'm deeply committed to the underlying principle that we should listen with heart and mind to each other in our various traditions. And so um, I'm particularly honored to, to present to this distinguished company a short paper on the subject of synodality and Anglicanism. The theme of synodality is dear to my heart and a matter of passionate commitment on my part. For me, synodality stands for the full participation of all Christian disciples in the whole life of the church. Baptized into the threefold messianic identity of Jesus Christ as prophet, priest, and king, and anointed by the Holy Spirit, all the faithful are called to a full share in the privileges and responsibilities of Christ's church. All have rights and all have duties. No Christian, no human being for that matter, should be excluded from the exercise of the privileges to which they are entitled or from the exercise of the responsibilities that are inseparable from those privileges. I'd like to begin the substance of my paper by clarifying what I understand by the topic of our consultation, synodality. I personally understand synodality to be the practical expression from time to time of the intrinsic conciliar nature of the Christian church as a spirit-filled community. I see synodality as a way of putting conciliarity into practice. Conciliarity belongs to the very nature of the church at all times. I think we need to be more aware of it and to live it out more fully. Synodality, on the other hand, as I see it, is the practical manifestation of conciliarity. Conciliarity emerges into action in synodical events and processes in order to resolve or remediate vexed issues or conflicts in the church. So let me just underline that point. It is um, a rather personal perspective. I'm convinced that conciliarity is an attribute or dimension of the Church of Christ that can never be taken away whereas synodality can be put into practice in different ways from time to time in the history of the church according to different traditions. <clears throat> For example, this consultation can be seen as an expression of conciliarity. 
It involves representatives of the churches and their traditions coming together for study, consultation, and discernment in the context of prayer. But this gathering is obviously not a synod. So there is some kind of difference. To my mind, synodality and conciliarity are very close in meaning, but there is a nuanced distinction between them. Conciliarity being a matter of ecclesiological principle and therefore constant through time, while synodality is a matter of practice and takes various pragmatic expressions. It may seem a little pedantic to some of you to try to differentiate between two concepts that are often treated as synonymous, but I think it's important, before we go any further, to uphold the essentially ontological and ecclesiolog ecclesiological nature of conciliarity in some degree of contrast to the more organizational and pragmatic character of synods. Conciliarity relates to the organic life of the church considered as a coherent whole, and it aims at every part of the church sharing, taking its share of responsibility for the discernment of truth, sensus fidei, and acting upon it. The desire that drives the conciliar dimension of the church is a longing for wholeness, coherence, and unity. It involves a constant process of spiritual discernment. I do not see conciliarity as being primarily about taking decisions or about process at all, but rather about a meeting of minds in the Holy Spirit, perhaps closest to the Eastern concept of subornost. Nevertheless, a synod cannot function without the constant quest for consensus. The term consensus has more than one meaning. The landmark joint declaration on the doctrine of justification agreed between the Lutheran World Federation and the Roman Catholic Church in 1999 employed the method of differentiated consensus, though it did not actually use that term. But that was its method. The declaration claimed that it represented what it described as a basic or fundamental consensus, leaving several secondary matters unresolved and earmarked for future study. Differentiated consensus. Consensus does not always equal unanimity or that everybody has to agree on everything. Now, conciliarity, working with the idea of the consensus fidelium, need not necessarily imply unanimity among the many and diverse participants. It does not need to achieve unanimity because conciliarity, as I understand it, is not ordered to the constant taking of decisions. Conciliarity is a function of the pilgrim church, making its exploratory journey into the divine mystery. Conciliarity may produce the first steps in clarifying and resolving an issue, or it may simply facilitate an argument in process. But a formal synod, on the other hand, as the practical and pragmatic expression of conciliarity, can set its own rules or have them set for it with regard to the majority that will be needed to qualify for a decision that will affect the life of the church. Nevertheless, every decision still needs to be received. In my paper, the concept of the church is understood in a strongly realist sense as the body of Christ, constituted by the ministry of word and sacrament through which the living Christ is present and active by the Holy Spirit. Synodality activates the innate authority that belongs to the baptized people of God and which is distributed throughout the whole body. Synodality gathers and focuses that authority when the church comes together in a representative way to take counsel for its well-being and the advancement of its mission. Synodality provides the concrete means by which all baptized Christians gathered by word and sacrament and under the oversight of their pastors as a community discharge their share of responsibility for the life of the church according 
to their various callings. If I can just pause there for a moment, uh, it, it has um, become clear to me that I'm operating with four key principles that could be summed up in one word, which I think uh, you know, I can elaborate in the course of the paper. But the principles are inclusion, participation, discipleship, responsibility. And I see uh, my task and our task as being to evoke and bring to life and to put into practice for all Christians, all baptized members of the Christian church, those four principles of inclusion, uh, participation, discipleship, and responsibility. Now, uh, a short section on the historical background to the concepts that we're operating with here. In order to grasp the theology and practice of synodality, I think we need to look at the historical background, in particular the late medieval and Reformation developments of conciliar theology and practice, which have shaped all the churches in the modern world, including the churches of the Anglican Communion. In the late medieval period, canon lawyers and theologians competed with each other to supply the popes with ever more inflated claims in order to bolster their power over against the emperor and other civil rulers within Christendom. There was a great rivalry going on. The pope was invested with God's power on earth and there were few constraints on papal authority. There was no higher court of appeal than the pope, not even the emperor, for spiritual power was said to include and exceed temporal power. The pope could be judged by no one. Beginning in the second half of the 11th century and continuing throughout the 12th, the papacy was progressively centralized and its administration was made more rigorous, while a higher degree of uniformity, according to the Roman model, was enforced. Nomination to various ecclesiastical offices and benefices accrued to the papacy, and so did a proportion of their revenues. By the 13th century, papal power was at its height, but a tax on the institution and its hierarchy and such criticisms were already common. This was the context, the historical context, for the catastrophic failure of the institution, that is of the papacy, when the great schism of the West broke out in 1378, the split at the center of the Catholic Church. The very constitution of the church as a hierarchical system was being widely challenged long before the Reformation. Let's not think the Reformation started it. It goes way back. What was at stake was the nature of the Catholic Church, that is the, the Western Christian Church, as a political society, particularly its structures of authority. The papacy began to be evaluated as a human institution and its grandiose claims began to be unmasked as forms of human legitimation. This radical and subversive vision formed the premise for ever louder rumblings of discontent and opposition to ecclesiastical privilege and papal interference in Germany, England, Scandinavia, and elsewhere in Europe, and the accompanying legal and constitutional ideology of that institution. The conciliar movement in the Western Church developed as a challenge to the monarchical structure of the papacy and as a response to the disasters that it had produced, above all the great schism of 1378, but also the chronic failure to address urgent issues of reform. Let me say a little bit more about the, this so-called great schism, which isn't the, what we normally call the great schism between East and West. The conciliar theory that, as I've mentioned, was already latent in medieval canon law, was given its opportunity by the Great Schism of 1378, which threw Christendom into an unprecedented trauma and was apparently insoluble. The schism was within the papal office itself. 
It was precipitated when the College of Cardinals became disillusioned with their recent choice of Pope, Urban VI. He had not only reduced the revenues of the Cardinals, but had further alienated them by his arrogant and erratic behavior and violent temper. They realized that they had made a mistake. Unable to reverse what they had done in electing the Pope, the Cardinals elected a second Pope, Clement VII. But the first Pope, Urban VI, refused to concede to Clement. The fact that the same College of Cardinals had canonically elected two popes within the space of a few months sent a shockwave throughout Europe and resulted in a dual system of popes, cardinals, curia, and ecclesiastical allegiances right down to the parochial clergy across the nations of Europe, and the nations took up different sides. The schism happened to coincide with the social and economic consequences of the Black Death. It occurred, moreover, in the year specified by various seers and prophets as the date when Antichrist will be manifested on earth. Little wonder that in those dark days, the schism was often seen in catastrophic and apocalyptic terms. A council was called the Council of Pisa, 1409, but it made matters worse. It deposed the two rival popes and elected a third but the existing two refused to accept the decision of the Council of Pisa, so now there were three popes. The Council of Pisa is not reckoned among the ecumenical councils. There was an urgent need, therefore, for a new constitutional instrument that would enable a council to be convened without the normal authority of a pope. A council should have been called by the pope, but that was plainly impossible. Cardinals themselves were discredited and divided. The emperor was too weak to unite the competing factions. In this context, scholars, particularly in the University of Paris, eminent among them Pierre Dailly and Jean Gerson, drew on earlier conciliar theory and practice. They began to build on the ancient principle that what affects all should be approved by all quod omnes tangit ab omnibus approbare debet. And they began to apply that principle that what affects all should be approved by all to the resolution of the schism. This dictum had been around for a long time. It had been codified by the Christian emperor Justinian. It had been incorporated into medieval canon law, for example, by Gratian. It was invoked by the conciliarists and still very much alive at the time of the Reformation, being quoted by Martin Luther on various occasions. It is regarded as axiomatic and unchallengeable. Against that very brief and inadequate historical background, I'd like to mention five characteristics of the conciliar theory that emerged at that time. These are characteristics or principles that I have drawn out uh, from my reading. Conciliar theory that attempted to address the crisis in the church was by no means monochrome, and there were constant internal debates among the conciliar thinkers. But I believe it's possible to identify five typical characteristics. First, conciliar thought held that the term the church means the whole body of the faithful not just the clergy, and that usage was not unheard of. The conciliar tradition developed the New Testament and Pauline image of the church as the body of Christ. The church is the whole body, the congregatio fidelium, and that body is the ultimate source of authority. That inherent authority of the body comes to expression in a representative way through councils and synods, above all through a general council. That's the first conciliar principle. Second, conciliar thought recognized national identities and aspirations, national. Not in any fully modern sense, as in 19th and 20th century nationalist movements, but to the, an extent that was subversive of an undifferentiated idea of Christendom held together by a central authority. 
The Council of Constance, which I'll mention again in a moment, for example, was largely composed of national delegations. The third principle is this. Conciliar thought lifted up the authority of general councils and wanted to see them held more frequently. It was the General Council of Constance that healed the internal schism of the Catholic Church, as we shall see shortly. But conciliar thought also endorsed a kind of subsidiarity in also affirming the role of lesser regional and national councils and synods, which had existed in earlier times and which it wanted to revive. It believed that conciliarity should be practiced at every level of the church's life. Councils. Fourth, conciliar thought employed academic contributions from the universities, rather like the Periti at Vatican II, except that scholars were sometimes given a voice in the deliberations of the councils at this time. Conciliar theory also gave a limited role to lay rulers. They were the main representatives of the laity at this time. Civil rulers, especially the Holy Roman Emperor, played a key role in enabling councils to happen, just as Constantine I compelled the bishops to meet at Nicaea in AD 325. Fifth, and this is the last principle I'll mention, conciliar thought invoked the common good of the church, status ecclesiae, the common good of the church as the criterion of decisions and laws. Influenced by the tradition of St. Thomas Aquinas, it held that sound law could not be arbitrary, but found its rationality in being suited to the nature of persons and communities. Law was given to serve the common good, and that takes priority over the good of individuals and the interests of individuals, however eminent they may be. Natural law, inscribed in the created order, and divine law revealed in scripture, are in complete harmony and point to the common good. Furthermore, natural law principles can be invoked when necessary to critique and reform the positive laws of the church. For example, exposing them as unjust or unfair. I've mentioned like five principles of conciliar thought, but there are particular ecclesiological principles I'd like to draw out very briefly now. Conciliar thought, which emerged and flourished at this time, although it had earlier antecedents, of course, conciliar thought hinged on four ecclesiological principles relating to the exercise of authority. They are, and this is my suggestion, constitutionality, representation, consent, and sacramental communion. The principle of constitutionality means that the scope and limits of authority are laid down, agreed, and acknowledged. This principle is incompatible with any strong form of monarchical authority which amounts to autocracy. Structures of authority need to embody checks and balances against the abuse of power. There were no constraints on the late medieval papacy as we have noted, unless the Pope became an outright heretic, in which case it was recognized by the canonists that the Pope, such a Pope could be deposed by a general council. I don't know there are any constraints on a Pope today, you would have to tell me, and that's absolutely fine if you like what the Pope is saying and doing, but not so good if you don't. Limits on authority safeguard the interests, the well-being of those who are subject to that authority and they safeguard it, and I'm using the word safeguard rather uh, intentionally and advisedly. They safeguard it against various kinds of abuse. Then there is a principle of representation. The principle of representation means that the authority that resides in the whole body is exercised through its elected or appointed representatives, since all the members of the body obviously cannot physically come together for that purpose. Representatives play their part according to their calling as lay person, deacon, priest, and bishop. Clearly, the episcopate does have a special, though not exclusive, responsibility for certain aspects of the life and thought of the church, doctrine, liturgy, ministry, unity. 
And I might just throw in that these special responsibilities are recognized in those canons and ordination liturgies of the Church of England that do refer to bishops. Then there is the principle of consent. The principle of consent means that the governed must, those who are governed must agree to how they are governed and have a say in it. Effective authority is always constrained by the need to obtain, at least in general terms, the consent of those subject to that authority. Because laws and decisions that lack general acceptance lose credibility and ultimately lack legitimacy. History shows that a people cannot be governed for any indefinite period against their will. Authority has to carry conviction and to be persuasive if it is to be effective. And this is particularly the case in the present age. The fifth ecclesiological principle is sacramental communion. The basic motive and purpose of synodality is to heal divisions, preserve the unity of the church, and make its mission more effective. The conciliar movement aimed to restore the broken communion of the Catholic Church. It succeeded at the Council of Constance in 1417 when all three rival popes were compelled to resign and a new pope, Martin V, was elected. To have a council or synod that includes bishops who are not in communion with each other and not in communion with the president bishop of the assembly would go against very basic ecclesiological principles of unity in the sacraments and unity in the bishop. Now, finally, conciliarity in Anglicanism, oh, very briefly. How is the conciliar life that is intrinsic to the, to the Christian church expressed in the Anglican communion? I'm focusing for a moment on the Ang Anglican communion as a whole, rather than on the Church of England, my own church, which is the mother church of this worldwide family. I want to focus then on the broad synodical principles that apply to the communion as a whole, not the minor differences of ecclesiastical polity that exist between various member churches. And um, my premises are threefold. First, Anglicanism shares with other Christian traditions the synodical or conciliar character that belongs to the very nature of the church. This fact is part of the ecclesial integrity of Anglican churches. Without it, they could not function as churches. They share in that conciliar attribute of the whole church. Secondly, Anglicanism inherits the history and principles of the 15th century conciliar movement, as these were further shaped by the Reformation. We've just noted uh, those various principles that can be derived from conciliar thought. These were carried forward to the Reformation period, but the 16th century reformers, Protestant reformers, were not full conciliarists, though they devoted much time and effort to the history and theology of councils. But they modified conciliar theory in three ways. First, by placing the authority of scripture over the authority of either pope or council, Secondly, by denying that general councils were infallible. Thirdly, awarding the proper authority to convene a council to the Christian civil ruler, a lay person. Thirdly, like the conciliar movement itself, the Anglican Communion acknowledges national identities and aspirations in its notion of provincial autonomy. Each member church of the Anglican Communion is self-governing. Anglicanism also recognizes the importance of cultural identity in its acceptance of the principle of enculturation, for example, in the right of each member church to produce its own liturgy and canon law, though in fact there is much common ground between them. And fourthly, because the Anglican communion does not have a common binding framework of law, the way that Anglican synodality operates across the communion is not coercive and not juridical but works by example, teaching, argument, and persuasion. That is to say, by moral and pastoral authority. Of course, ecclesial authority operates differently within each member church, where church law is enforceable with regard to the clergy, though a light touch tends to prevail, except in cases of serious misconduct. So finally, finally, 
in the light of these factors that I have mentioned. I see the Anglican Communion with its structures of discernment, consultation and deliberation, together with its constant quest for consensus, as a valid example of conciliar Catholicism, and one that is well adapted to the conditions of modernity that all churches face today. Thank you. Professor Paul, on behalf of all of us here, I wish to express my profound gratitude as you have exposed in clear terms the structural concepts of synodality and conciliarity and how they are seen and practiced in an Anglican perspective. And you made a very useful distinction from the beginning between conciliarity on the one hand, which allows discussion and which doesn't need to achieve unanimity. And you also mentioned on a personal note that it, it is an attribute of the Church of Christ and that it, is, it allows for a constant process of a spiritual discernment. And synodality on the other end brings about the ability for the people of God to come to a decision according to their diverse callings under the guidance of the Holy Spirit for the well-being of the church. Tracing back the genealogy of conciliar thought, you have described the different aspects of abusive authority in medieval history and how it eventually paved the way for the, for the flourishing of uh, conciliar thinking and a conciliar way of being church. And in your final remarks, you are mentioned how the Anglican communion with its structures of discernment, consideration, and deliberation comes as a valid and relevant example of conciliar Catholicism able to face the modern redefinition of power. Thank you so much for this uh, clear. Um, paper that you presented to us. Friends, the method adopted for this symposium is to invite a listener from the Catholic Church to, uh, <clears throat> who would create by uh, intervention spaces for further conversations that would enable a greater spirit of understanding uh, about the church structures of the other and its way of functioning. So I have now the great pleasure to invite online our listener for this session, Professor Anne-Marie Meyer. Thank you for accepting to be a listener for this session. You're very welcome. Well, thank you for having me uh, online from Trier and um, good morning to everyone in the room. I'm afraid at the moment I can't see you, but uh, if, if you don't mind that I speak at a sort of random to all in the room, uh, this will be fine. So first of you, thanks a lot. Thanks very much to Professor Avis for his insightful presentation that took into account the historical background of our topic, synodality and Anglicanism, and put an emphasis on the history as well. This is very important for, to each member church of the Anglican Communion applies that it is episcopally led yet synodically governed. So the Anglican model of being church combines bishops and synods something we Catholics would also like to combine and learn from you in a more effective way. So let me start by pointing out two main learning points and one question which I have heard when listening to your presentation. The first learning point would be as Catholics, don't think synodality is totally foreign to your DNA, but own your own history of conciliarity and synodality. 
Although I live in Trier now, I originally come from the region of the Lake of Constance. In the city of Constance, one can still visit the large building next to the shore of the lake where the Council of Constance took place. In fact, these days it is a quite good restaurant. And the Catholics who live in that region are aware of the Council having taken place there between 1414 and as the 16th ecumenical council that the Catholic Church counts. In fact, it was the last council of the United Church in the West before the Reformation. Thus, in order to explore the ways of how synodality might best work out, we Catholics ought to rummage the cupboards of our own history too and look for inspirational concepts like the concept you presented to us, the concept of familiar theory. A second learning point to mention would be use the instruments of communion you already have for living out synodality. If we Catholics look at the Anglican communion, it has two important instruments of communion. These two bodies, although quite influential, are consultative rather than jurisdictional. The first one of them is the primates meeting, which more or less, we could say, corresponds to what we Catholics have as synod of bishops. We are now in the middle of preparing for the 16th Ordinary General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops since Vatican II. The second important instrument of communion is the Anglican Consultative Council, which is the only instrument of communion to include lay people. And the question for us Catholics is whether anything might correspond to this on the Catholic side. In your presentation, Professor Avis, I heard you differentiate between synodality and conciliarity. Link the latter to consensus and to the conciliar theory underlining conciliarism. At the Council of Constant, this was applied for the first time. It was a very good occasion for doing so, as you pointed out, because of the great schism necessary to find consensus on who would be the legitimate pope. Between 1309 and 1376, the pope had resided at Avignon instead of Rome. So when Gregory XI died, the cardinals, out of fear that the new pope would return to Avignon, elected an Italian, Pope Urban VI. The last Pope, by the way, who had not been a member of the College of Cardinals before his election. After 29 new Cardinals had been appointed by Urban VI, the same College of Cardinals, plus the 29, shortly afterwards elected a Frenchman, Pope Clement VII, as you also pointed out. Because, as you said, they were not happy with the way how he behaved himself, Urban VI. Attempt to heal this schism of the papacy, a council was convoked to Pisa in 1409. In the meantime, Benedict XIII, Avignon, and Gregory XII, Rome, had been appointed as successors and were declared deposed by the Council of Pisa. The College of Cardinals, composed of members of both the Avignon uh, obedience and the Roman obedience, then elected Alexander V as new pope. Yet the other two refused to step down. So from 1409 onwards, there were then three popes. And this was the situation where the conciliar theory was tried out again to mend the situation. The Council of Constance, as a fact, set itself three main goals. The causa unionis, so the goal of unity, which amen amended this um, situation of having three popes instead of just one. Secondly, the causa fidei, the goal of faith, uniting the faith. 
which was implemented by putting a ban on the lay chalice and, yeah, not so nicely, burning Jan Hus in 1415. And thirdly, the causa reformationis, so the question of reform. And this is where we want to stick to, concentrate on, which led to the two documents, frequence stipulating a council, that councils should be convened regularly, and Hexancta, reinforcing the supremacy of the decisions of the Council over the Pope. So finally, in 1417, Martin V was elected as sole legitimate Pope, healing the Great Schism. The Causa Unionis had been accomplished, as had the Causa Fide. The Causa Reformationis still had to be implemented. In 1431, the Council of Basel, Baal, started and reaffirmed Hexanta. Yet this council, though explicitly based on the conciliar theory, also split. One part went to Ferrara Florence to bring about the union with the Greek, an errand which eventually failed. The other moved to Lausanne. This implementation of the conciliar theory, however, once more led to a schism. So in the end, there were again two popes, Pope Eugenius IV, who in 1437 had transferred the council to Ferrara. And since 1439, a layman, the Duke of Savoy, Amadeus VIII, who took the name of Pope Felix V. By this time, the theory that underlies conciliarism had, all, had clearly proven not to be infallible in the sense of when applied, it will safeguard always against schism. It did not. I guess a mere theory simply will never do so. One can debate whether already the election of Martin V, or later on then the schism which resulted from the Council of Basel uh, actually led to uh, this question of should we proceed with conciliar theory or not. In any case, nevertheless, the conciliar theory can be valuable, a valuable inspiration to the present Catholic endeavor of synodality by emphasizing, as you put out these five points, um, of emphasizing the congregatio fidelium, recognizing national difference differences, pleading for holding conciliar gatherings more frequently, employing academic theology, and employing the common good of the church. Yet the question which I heard implicitly when listening to your presentation was, after having decided in the aftermath of the Council of Constance and Council of Baal, to go down a different path than conciliarism, which in the end led to the Reformation and eventually to defining papal infallibility at the First Vatican Council. So the question is now for us Catholics, is it still possible that the Roman Catholic Church, after all that, engages into real synodality? Did they not block their own way to this in Vatican I? Is it still possible to invert a top-down hierarchical pyramid starting with the Pope? Although it is true that the First Vatican Council tried to counter Gallicanism, which somehow had evolved from conciliarism, one has to reckon with conditions of the allegedly unconditional claim of papal infallibility at the First Vatican Council. Of course, there are the historical conditions at the time in the 19th century to be taken into account, but I would say there are also very important conditions which are innate to the concept itself, yet, yet which are not made explicit in the definition of Pastor Eternus. Rather, they are explained in the texts that accompany and explain this definition. If one looks more closely, there are restrictions regarding the subject, the object, and the act itself. Regarding the subject, the conditions for issuing an infallible statement are only given if the Pope acts as supreme pastor and teacher of all Christians. Regarding the object, 
the restrictions only allow matters of faith and morals to be defined. And finally, the act itself, only if the decisions are going to irrevocably bind all the faithful, then it is a um, valid act. Very few actual conditions seem to fulfill all three prerequisites, so that in history this has only been implemented twice. And even then, the Pope needed to keep to the obligatory auxilia, the means, the helps. Um, they are scripture and tradition, and what was called at the uh, First Vatican Council, testimonium ecclesiarum, the faith of the church that can be discerned by means of councils, synods, questioning the members of the church, or other apt means, depending on the conditions of the context and issue. In order, however, to avoid any impression of formulating a juridical condition, this was then formulated at the Council as a reference to the historical practice of the popes. Therefore, it was labeled as opportunitas aut aliqua relativa necessitas, so something that's an opportunity or a relative necessity. The Council clarified that popes cannot re receive any new revelation. Given this reconnection of the Pope to the Church, even in light of the First Vatican Council, it is still possible to conceive of the Catholic Church as a synodal church in the sense of an inverted pyramid where the top is located beneath the base. Pope Francis pointed out when commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Synod of Bishops, 2015. It is also still possible, as the International Theological Commission put it in 2018, to achieve synodality as, and here I put them, the particular style that qualifies the life and mission of the Church, expressing her nature as the people of God journeying together and gathering in assembly, summoned by the Lord Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim the gospel. Synodality ought to be expressed in the church's ordinary way of living and working. This modus vivendi et operandi works through the community listening to the word and celebrating the Eucharist. The brotherhood of communion and the co-responsibility and participation of the whole people of God in its life and mission on all levels and distinguishing between various ministries and roads. So far, the International Theological Commission. This is what we Catholics eventually hope to achieve by listening to you Anglicans and learning from you as Anglicans. Thank you very much. Professor Mayer, thank you very much for your insightful comments uh, in response to the paper presented by Professor Havis. You have mentioned about the instruments of communion, which is not uh, juridical, but consultative. You have also mentioned about the role of the Anglican Consultative Council. And uh, you've also uh, brought about a historical perspective of your own understanding on conciliarity. And, and, and synodality. But to allow us to engage in more discussions, I would now, time has come for us to give you the floor so that questions may, may come from you. So to, to get the ball ro rolling, I have a first question to you, Professor. Uh, what I'm thinking about has to do with the autonomy of the provinces of the Anglican Communion. The autonomy of each province may at times run the risk of alienating others. Each province can, while using its autonomy, make decisions that have repercussions and effects on other parts of the communion. This indirectly challenges the ancient principle of synodality that what affects all should be approved by all. Beside the Anglican Consultative Council, what could be, according to you, in your view, and according to the Anglican conciliar theory, possible ways of securing communion and conciliarity in these situations. Thank you very much for that.
very simple question. <laughs> no, your question, Archbishop Ian, goes to the root of the matter um, because it touches on the way that the Anglican communion of churches uh, fits together. And it is a communion. It is a communion. Uh, it is founded on sacramental communion and the interchangeability of ordained ministries at every level. Of course, there is also um, um, a, a, a foundation in doctrine and liturgy, uh, history and spirituality. It is a communion, but it is a communion, and this is maybe a strange concept to some, of self-governing churches. Personally, as you may have noticed, I don't use the term provinces. I don't really know how that crept in. It's a little bit of a historical detective story to try and find out. They are member churches of the communion. And I think it's good to use the language of churches. This is, this is what we are as Anglicans. A communion of self-governing, i.e. autonomous, churches. They make their own decisions. So how to put into practice that old principle that what affects all must be approved by all is the ultimate challenge, is the ultimate challenge. Of course, I mustn't take up too much time trying to answer your question because there'll be other questions coming from the floor. But I would like to say that um, the communion that Anglicans enjoy is one that can sustain quite serious differences. Not differences over creedal doctrine, which we rehearse and reiterate in our worship every day and every Sunday, but other differences about the way in which Christian beliefs and principles are put into practice in the present age and in different cultures. So I think that it's extremely important that we hold on to the fact that we are a communion and that that can sustain and embrace differences of interpretation of Christian beliefs and Christian ethics, actually. I will just mention that uh, there was um, a very serious attempt a few years ago to find a way forward of embracing communion indifference, and that was the proposed Anglican Covenant Anglican Covenant, which I personally supported um, and, and wrote in favor of and spoke in favor of, um, it failed. And it was, it, 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 it was a way of saying, if a church wants to go down a route and a path that uh, will create difficulties for other member churches, there should be a process of consultation and mediation. <laughs> Um, it wasn't uh, essentially juridical, coercive, or punitive, but it was to do with consultation and mediation because that's the path you have to go down in the Anglican Communion. Unfortunately, it failed, but it, um, I don't know how much you know, members here know about it, but uh, that was the essence of it. It failed partly because it was very much misunderstood and misrepresented. So we have tried very hard, and we need to keep trying and that's where I think I need to stop trying to answer your difficult question. Thank you very much. I didn't mean to be difficult, but no, at no, least no. to clarify where, who we are. Thank you very much. Now it's for you to ask your questions. Thank you, uh, Bishop Christopher. Thank you very much. Uh, this is really a comment on both uh, Dr. Paul Avis's um, uh, uh, very fruitful presentation and also the response thank you very much indeed um, and that is uh, I, I trust that people will understand what I mean when I talk about the elephant in the room which has not yet really been explored um, with the with Paul's presentation we hear of the uh, healing of unity through conciliarity constants etc um, but we also heard that that unity didn't that unity didn't last there were further systems uh, and, um, uh, within the structure of the Catholic Church in the West. And the, um, 
in both cases uh, of schism, um, first conciliarity healed, and then a pattern of papal monarchy. But it did heal, but it was papal monarchy. Now, what happened on the, with some of the other churches when we come to the Reformation, and not just the Church of England? As Paul has already said, the conciliarity was in fact modified uh, in the Reformers, uh, and what emerged, not just in the Church of England, by another form of monarchy. So monarchy is the elephant in the room, either papal monarchy or nationalistic monarchy. And uh, after all, the Church of England has a supreme governor in King Charles III. <laughs> um, to whom I'm very, I'm very loyal, but, uh, as Paul knows, in various ways. But uh, so I, th th there could be an interesting discussion as to where we move now, all of us together in the ecumenical movement and in our particular relationships between uh, various churches and the Roman Catholic Church, um, how, how that monarchical principle is indeed all the time being modified, not least in the synodal process of the Catholic Church at the moment, um, and as it has been in the Church of England in the way we have a constitutional monarchy, and that affects the governance of the Church of England too. Uh, so things move on, but um, just a, a comment, I'm not really asking a, a, a response, but uh, just to, to note that, that monarchy, I think, skewed ecclesiology in both cases, Catholic and Protestant, in my view. Thank you very much. Uh, may I ask those who are going to ask questions to introduce yourselves first? Thank you. I'm Dan Daniel Morris Chapman, a Methodist minister in Rome. Um, to what extent does the political links that the Church of England has with the British uh, nation shape the course of its giving autonomy? So because the British nation had a colonial history and thus then gave autonomy to the colonies, has the Church of England followed that paradigm rather than remaining a, a global uh, juridical organi organism? It's kind of echoed the paradigm of the British state in... Uh, has that shaped this, this development of um, Anglicanism? Thank you very much for that question. And um, I would say yes and inevitably, insofar as um, former British colonies were given their independence and became self-governing. So their churches wanted to do the same. And the example of the American Revolution and then the formation of the uh, what was the, the Protestant Episcopal Church of the USA is now simply the Episcopal Church, uh, you know, is, is a prime example of that and perhaps the, possibly the first. Um, I think that that is so, and that is because whether in church or state, people want to exercise their right of self-determination and take responsibility for themselves. So I think you're only asking about the sort of post-colonial uh, dimension or perspective. You're not asking me about the relationship between the Church of England and the state in the United in England, are you? No, no fine. Okay. Yes, Jan Hallebeek, Old Catholic Church. Thank you for your paper. Um, you spent quite some attention to the conciliar thoughts of the late Middle Ages, and you see, if I understood you correctly, a sort of a kind of continuity into Anglicanism. But at the same time, you mentioned uh, certain uh, alterations, certain changes. And I was just wondering, those are quite important, especially the, the independency, the certain autonomy to a certain level of local churches. Um, should we not acknowledge that uh, to a certain extent, uh, Anglicanism has also rejected major thoughts of the late medieval conciliar thought, and it uh, uh, at least 
um, I think it's also, besides continuity, I think there is also an, an enormous amount of discontinuity into, uh, into Anglicanism. Yeah? If you, it's not only that point, but I think it's the most striking point, the tension for the independency or the autonomy of local churches. And that was my question. Should we be a little bit more cautious to emphasize discontinuity? Yes, thank you. Uh, that follows on quite neatly from the, la from the last question. I think that the, th the three ways in which Reformation thought diverged from the classical conciliar tradition uh, were very much to do with the pressures and power struggles of the time. I mean, the first one I mentioned was that the reformers insisted that the authority of scripture should uh, trump or supersede the authority of councils. So I'll just comment very briefly on that. Of course, scripture always needs to be interpreted. And I don't think, personally, I don't think it's sufficient to say the authority of scripture is number one. And, and, um, uh, because councils can play a role in the interpretation of scripture and so do other forms of um, conciliar discernment or synodical uh, practice, to use, to use my terms. Also, the role of the, of the civil ruler, because um, in the 39 Articles of the Church of England, um, general councils may only be uh, convened by the uh, sovereign. Right? So that's very much a thing of the, of the time, very much a thing of the time. However, uh, also within the 39 Articles, there is a, um, a very strong affirmation of the role of general councils. Uh, they are not regarded as infallible. They may err and have erred, so the Articles say. But I would um, suggest that general councils if they could ever happen in our present circumstances, are regarded by Anglicans as the supreme um, authority on this earth for deciding vexed questions. So that is very strongly affirmed in, in, the Angl in Anglican thought. And, and I'm just got, glad I've got the opportunity to say that. And it will open a new chapter, so stop me if it doesn't fit. Hans Lessing, uh, Acting General Secretary of the World Communion of Reformed Churches. I would like to hear your take on the ecumenical impact of the understanding of conciliarity and synodality which you have developed, particularly with the um, identity of the World, Communion of, uh, World Council of Churches as a conciliar body. Thank you very much for that question, which I, I welcome very warmly. I have to be fairly brief in, in answering it. I think that um, we can say that the work of the ecumenical movement over the past century and a bit more can be seen as a, an admirable manifestation of the conciliar character of the Christian church as a whole. This is Christian churches reaching out to each other in order to understand each other and to create greater conditions of mutual, uh, not only understanding, but trust and cooperation. What we don't have between our diverse Christian churches is synodality from one church to another. So the WCC is not a synod. It is not a council. It's called a council of churches, but it's not a council in the classical or strict sense of the word. That will be unacceptable uh, to many churches who participate or belong uh, to its uh, activities. So I, I think it, I would very much welcome this as a note on which to finish this session. That the ecumenical movement, with, with all its uh, faith and order work and, and the other dimensions, missionary work and life and work, is an expression of the conciliar nature of the Christian church um, revealing itself and, and putting itself uh, to work to bring churches together, greater mutual understanding and trust. Thank you.
Thank you very much, um, Professor Paul Avis, and thank you for the last word that our ecumenical conversations become more synodal. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a very productive and fruitful session, and I would love to thank also Professor Mayer for your contribution and all of you for your questions. Uh, a big applause to our <laughs> keynote speaker. Thank you very much. Now you are our guest, so please, the coffee will be served not at the bar, but in the Sala Colonne. So there are three of our postdoc assistants that are our angels all these days that will conduct you going out on the right side. So please, uh, and we will start at 11. You realize that the time is really short, so please be, be ready to be with us. Thank you very much. Professor Avis and Professor Maya.
Thank you very much to being with us again. Uh, I am very pleased to, to give the floor to Professor Sister Helen Alford. She has been the vice director, vice director of the university, but now she is uh, the dean of the Faculty of so Social Sciences. And she is English, so you will not have to suffer my accent, so it's good. But Sister Helen has been a very, has helping a lot in producing and presenting the Anglican social teaching to the students at the Angelicum. So I think this is really an important way also of being in ecumenism from a level of interdisciplinary matters. So thank you very much, Sister Helen, to be with us. It's a pleasure. Do I need to press something here? No, it comes on already. Okay, great. So thank you very so much, Father Uzma, and to all the organizers of this wonderful event. Um, I'm very honored to be here, and especially on this platform with so many big brains, you know, big minds, who are going to be sharing their knowledge and skills with us. Um, as Father Uzma was saying, um, my main connection with the ecumenical activities here is through the um, discussion of the Western traditions, uh, social teaching, because I'm in social sciences and social teaching of the church is very important for us. Um, and we just had last week the, uh, the session in the Ut Unum Sint program here, looking at the social teaching in different traditions um, it, with regard to um, what they are doing in the course. And I was just saying to uh, the professor here that um, it's really a challenge for me to talk about the Anglican teaching because when you talk about the Catholic teaching, you can say, well, there's this principle, there's that principle, and there's the other principle. And that. But to really kind of communicate to what are basically Catholic students, the way that Anglicans think, this very rich way in 40 minutes, it's one of the biggest challenges of the academic year for me. <laughs> but it's good, you know, it's great. And, it, you know, it, it, they, they, they like it. You know, I think some of them are here and they came up and said they liked it. So, you know, it's wonderful for them to see this other way of thinking about social problems, you know. Anyway, okay, so we're very, I'm very glad to be here now. So let's move straight on to listening to this panel as part of listening to the Western traditions on synodality. So the first person who's going to speak to us now is Venerable William Will Adam. Uh, as it says here in your program, he's Archdeacon of Canterbury. Um, he is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Um, he's had a lot of interesting 
uh, roles in the Anglican Church, as you know, including co-secretary of a number of international ecumenical dialogues, so he's very well um, versed in this kind of thing, and has many publications in the fields of ecclesiology and canon law. So I'm very glad to hand over to him to give us uh, about 20 minutes, I think, on uh, the historical signposts under our main title, Anglican Communion and Synodality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sister. Just a note on personnel. It may not have uh, escaped your notice that all four Anglican speakers uh, are from one particular church, uh, the Church of England, whereas the average Anglican, as the Archbishop of Canterbury is very fond of saying, is a, a, a woman from sub-Saharan Africa aged under 40. Uh, so it's good that Archbishop Yarn is here to show us something of the breadth of the Anglican Communion. <laughs> Professor Avis has outlined the inheritance that Anglicanism has received from the Universal Church, in particular the medieval Western Church and the conciliar movement. But when the Church of England and later wider Anglicanism emerged as a separate entity, it built on that conciliar tradition in distinctive ways. So the question is, what is the distinctive tradition of synodality in Anglicanism, and what are the historic events and movements that brought that about? The key thing, I believe, as already noted, is that decision-making in Anglicanism seeks to include the whole people of God and at the same time to balance with this the episcopal structure of the church, keeping a special place for bishops within synodical structures. The earliest model of distinctive Anglican decision-making structures emerged in the 16th century Church of England. This church included at the time diocese now in the church in Wales, a distinct member church, and there was a marked similarity in Ireland. There's too little time to go into the rich history, as it were, of the nations of the British Isles, but to note that very early on, there was a separate and distinct Anglican structure in Scotland. So the history of Anglicanism outside England has a much longer tradition than one might imagine. But of course, in terms of the history of Anglicanism, uh, we have to mention King Henry VIII, the famous figure, uh, and his, um, we all know the story about his six wives and the link between the break from Rome and his desire to divorce one and marry another and increase his chances of fathering a male heir. But there is much more to it. Henry had a political worldview of England as an empire like the other empires of Europe. And he saw his empire as a united people in one nation and one church, united around one godly king. There was no room in this structure for interference from a foreign power in the government of England, nor of appeals against decisions made in England to a jurisdiction overseas. And that, of course, took out that great industry of medieval Europe with appeals to Rome. So point one is the importance of the national level of church government, what Archic three terms regional, in which England uh, aligned the ancient concept of metropolitan province with nation state. In decision making, Henry used parliament to legitimize his changes. It was statutes, statute law made by Parliament in Westminster in London that brought about change in the church, mainly during the 1530s. Monasteries were dissolved, appeals to Rome were banned, and decisions on all aspects of church life were subject to royal and parliamentary approval. Now, Parliament included all the bishops. There are still 26 of them in Parliament, but everybody else in Parliament was a lay person, as was the king. So the second point is the inclusion of laity and decision-making in all aspects of church life, including doctrine and liturgy. But lay people were all members of the Church of England at that time, indeed up until the law changed to enable others to come in, particularly Catholics, into Parliament in 1829. Also worth noting that decisions uh, were enforced and discipline was enforced in the king's courts, not necessarily in a separate system of church courts. This therefore affected the character of the law 
and those students of Anglican and Catholic canon law will see a very a real difference in the in in the in the canon law because of the difference between Anglo-Saxon common law traditions and what we might call continental civil law traditions. But it wasn't only political. Henry VIII was not a natural Protestant, but the waves of Protestant thought that came to the, sh came to the shores of England from other parts of Europe, and the political allied with the theological in the development of this model of decision-making. It was not until much later that any body other than Parliament made laws for the Church of England. The convocations, deliberative bodies of bishops and other clergy, had their life curtailed at the Reformation, and they fell into disuse until they were revived in the 19th century in England. Parliament, though, legislated to set up a church assembly, now called the General Synod, in 1919. And this assembly combined the convocations and a new elected house of laity. And Father Dewhurst and Bishop Hill will tell us more about this later. But the particular time of the establishment of Anglicanism also uh, was the time of expansion, imperial and trade expansion around the world. And so Anglicanism outside the British Isles came as a result of this, with chaplains going overseas and congregations and later dioceses springing up in other parts of the world. But it's important to note that the story is very different in other parts of the Anglican Communion. And the story of the United States or North America um, um, is illustrative here. Up to 1776 and American independence, there was no bishop in the area that was to become the USA, no Church of England or Anglican bishop. After 1776, Parliament in London could not legislate for a country it did not control. It could try. Uh, but it wouldn't have had much effect. <laughs> and the bishops in England were, up until the mid-1780s, prevented by law from consecrating a bishop without a royal mandate and somebody who couldn't swear an oath of allegiance to the king. So, when the Episcopal Church of the USA held its first convention in 1785, there was only one bishop who'd had to be consecrated in Scotland and no system of diocese. Congregations... Involve, um, sorry, organized themselves into state conventions, and the state conventions sent deputies, that's clergy and laity, to a general convention. Now, this was a similar result in the involvement of the laity in, and um, inferior clergy, as we call them, in all aspects of church life, but from a very different standpoint to that in England because it had a lot to do with democratic ideals of the nascent United States. As more bishops were ordained and a system of dioceses formed, the General Convention acquired a House of Bishops alongside the House of Deputies, and thus the bicameral um, convention has remained. Elsewhere in the expanding Anglican world, bishops were appointed or elected, and dioceses were set up. Dioceses then, bit by bit, became grouped into provinces under metropolitans. And these provinces became autonomous and self-governing, and their self-government was expressed in synodical structures. I'm going to just step off my paper to answer specifically Daniel's question from earlier. And there was a, a, a similarity, a mirroring of church independence in Anglicanism with, if you like, post-colonial independence, where a, a na when a nation became independent from the United Kingdom, its laws, for instance, and its processes became the law that was in force at the time in that place until it was changed. The same thing happened with the setting up of independent churches within the Anglican Communion, in that the canon law uh, and the structures that were in place at the time stayed until they were changed. So the canon law of the Church of England, as it applied in Australia, became the original canon law of the Anglican Church of Australia until they then developed it. The last example of this was actually only last year when the new Igreja Anglicana do Mozambique a Angola 
um, sorry for my Portuguese, uh, became uh, separate from the Anglican Church of South Africa and the canon law of South Africa translated into Portuguese is, is still the law of that place. So what this historical interlude tells us is that the non-Church of England tradition in Anglicanism is deep-seated, deep and there have been churches which have been self-governing and independent of England for centuries. Yet there is a tangible sense of ecclesial communion maintained through the historic succession of bishops. Those two points I mentioned earlier, um, national and provincial churches and involvement of the whole people of God are embedded in the history of the churches. The involvement of the laity can be seen theologically as an expression of the sharing of the whole people of God in the priestly ministry of Christ. Resolution 94 of the Lambeth Conference 1958 states, the conference, believing that the laity as baptized members of the body of Christ share in the priestly ministry of the church and in responsibility for its works, calls upon Anglican men and women throughout the world to realize their Christian vocation both by taking their full part in the church's life and by Christian witness and dedication in seeking to serve God's purpose in the world. In most member churches, there has emerged a three-house model of national synods, often also reflected at diocesan level. National or provincial synods are typically deliberative rather than consultative, and they are legislative. The particular laws of the church concerned will lay down any regulations for the making and implementing of legislation. A particular feature that is typically present in the constitutions of the synods of the Anglican churches is the necessity for agreement broadly across the houses of a synod. And there is provision often for voting by houses so that one particular house, bishops, clergy or laity, can't be forced into something against their will and cannot force a change on the others. These previous examples may well be familiar to colleagues, but from the world of politics rather than from the church, bicameral and tricameral um, parliamentary style systems. It's been pointed out though, including by the archic document walking together on the way, the Erfurt statement, that Anglican synodical processes are very like those of parliaments. Archic went so far as to su suggest that such processes, quote, can sometimes obscure the teaching authority of the College of Bishops. However, the variety of the Anglican Communion is such that different synodical processes may be discerned in the churches. It's fair to say that in some parts of the world, much more authority, either by design or by practice, is concentrated in the hands of the primate or the metropolitan at national level, and at the bishop at diocesan level than in the synodical or representative body. On the other hand, there are parts of the world where alternative non-parliamentary decision-making processes have been brought into the life of the church. For instance, in the structure of the church in Aotearoa, New Zealand and Polynesia, or in parts of the Anglican Church of Canada, where indigenous decision-making processes have been brought in under the umbrella of a recognizably Anglican synodical structure. Now, lastly, the instruments of communion. The historical development of Anglican churches has led to a situation of 42 autonomous churches, each of which claims to be part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Each has the heritage of the undivided church just received through the distinctive Anglican inheritance. But the Anglican communion is a communion of churches, not a worldwide church in itself. But it has developed structures known as instruments of communion to express a common life. The first is the Archbishop of Canterbury. For one of the definitions of being Anglican is that a church is in communion with the See of Canterbury. Now, there are churches that are in communion with the See of Canterbury that are not Anglican. Some of them are here. And that demonstrates, therefore, that there is more to being Anglican than just communion with the See of Canterbury. Paul has already mentioned the liturgical, spiritual, and theological traditions that bind us together. The Archbishop of Canterbury has no overall authority in the communion, save that by convention, he's the one who calls together the Lambeth Conference and the Primates Meeting. 
he has no direct authority in any other church of the communion unless and until that church gives authority to him. It's not inherent in his office. The second instrument of communion is the Lambeth Conference. Arguably, interestingly, given uh, uh, what we've heard earlier, the most synodical of the four instruments. It was first called together in 1867 to address a crisis in the South African church. And there was debate as to whether the conference could make canons, whether the decisions of the conference were to be binding on the churches, and whether it was to be described as a synod. The Archbishop of York at the time did not attend the first Lambeth Conference as he feared all those possibilities. In the end, the Lambeth Conference has met roughly every 10 years and it has proved to be just that, a conference. All the active, that's not retired bishops, are invited from the churches of the communion, most attend. They confer and with the exception of three of the conferences have issued not canons but resolutions. The resolutions are not devoid of authority, but the authority is persuasive rather than arbitrary. Third is the Anglican Consultative Council. Whilst the life of the Lambeth Conference is developed by stages informally and, and to a certain extent dependent on the part of the world at the time where you are, the Anglican Consultative Council is a body constituted by law. It has a constitution. It's a registered charity in England and Wales. The members of the council are nominated as representatives of the member churches, bishops, clergy, and laity. And the principal function of the ACC is to finance and direct the work of the Secretariat of the Anglican Communion Office in support of the mission and ministry of the member churches. It's not a synod, and it makes no claims to be so. And the fourth instrument is the primates meeting, the youngest of the instruments, but building on earlier meetings of metropolitans. And this is bringing together the primate, which is the metropolitan or archbishop, however they're, or moderator, however they're termed, uh, from the member churches. Of late, it can be discerned that the primates meeting, which is actually easier to convene than the Lambeth Conference or ACC, has been the forum where different difficult or contentious issues within the life of the communion have been discussed where the primates have made their minds known and, uh, the, and, the, uh, and have, to a certain extent, then been brought to effect within the churches of the communion. The instruments of communion allow for and support interaction between the member churches, but in a way that is generally consultative and discursive rather than legislative. The history of Anglicanism as it developed in the years following the Reformation we can see the certain principles that underlie decision-making and synodality. First and foremost, there is the participation of the whole people of God in the triamunera, the teaching, sanctifying, and governing work of Christ through his church. Anglicanism, in contradistinction to some of the other churches stemming from the Reformation, retained the threefold order of bishops, priests, and deacons, and places in the ministry of the bishop and of bishops collectively a special and distinct role within the ministry of all the baptized. Particularly as we dwell on the governing and decision-making functions of the church, the laity has a key place, including in questions of a doctrinal or liturgical nature in the decision-making of the church. Second, we discern the importance of the church at what Archic defined as the regional level. This is often, but not always, national level but can trace its ecclesiastical pedigree back to the metropolitan province of dioceses and their bishops, clergy, and people grouped together with a metropolitan or primate bishop at the head. Third, the principle of provincial autonomy is strongly held. Member churches are the locus of authority, and each has a synodical structure to exercise that authority and government, governance. There are instruments of communion that allow the member churches to confer and to discuss matters of common concern. But each member church or province is autonomous. Thank you. I'd like to thank very much the Archdeacon. I think he not only gave us historical signposts, but he also gave us a sense of this global 
cultural diversity, so we have this temporal aspect, uh, sorry, this so spatial aspect alongside the temporal one, which I think is very helpful for us and probably a very good mo way to transition to our next speaker, who is Professor Russell Dewhurst, Reverend Professor Russell Dewhurst, um, a fellow of the uh, Center of Law and Religion at Cardiff University. I was very interested as someone who's in the Faculty of Social Sciences here that his doctoral research was on the principle of subsidiarity, and I'm in canon law, I'll have to read it. Um, in 2021-22, uh, he chaired the International Committee revising the principles of canon law common to the churches of the Anglican Communion. We've been hearing, of course, about that diversity and also the communion as well in the previous speaker. So the revised decision was, edition, sorry, was launched at the Lambeth Conference last year. Uh, I also mentioned that he's a member of the colloquium of Anglican and Roman Catholic canon lawyers and knows our, one of our canon lawyers here, Father Bob Ombrace, very well. So I'm very happy to hand over to Professor Dewhurst to talk about canonical approaches. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sister. I'd like to start with um, a little scripture. Moses, fatigued by governance duties which lasted from morning to evening, was counseled by his father-in-law, the work is too heavy for you. Jethro proposed the tasks be shared with others and said, that will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. In synodical government, the bishops of the Anglican Communion share the tasks of governance in the church so that the gifts of all may be employed for God's purposes. Well, it's, it's a great honor to be speaking at this conference, and I've been asked to speak about the Anglican canonical approach to synodality. And I first want to address the question of whether that's even something possible to talk about. We've heard that the Anglican Communion is composed of over 40 member churches. Some of them are made up of one ecclesiastical province, such as the church in Wales, for example. Some are made of several ecclesiastical provinces, such as the church of Ni Nigeria. But each of these member churches is understood to be legally autonomous. And as we've uh, just heard from uh, Father Adam the, there are instruments of communion, but they have only persuasive, not jurisdictional authority. Instead, as a facet of its legal autonomy, each of the member churches has its own system of canon law. This allows local adaptation, inculturation suitable to the needs of each church. But it presents a problem, not least uh, for purposes of ecumenical dialogue. If we ask, what is the canon law of the Anglican Communion? What does Anglican canon law say about baptism or ordination or synodality? Do we have to consult over 40 separate systems of law to answer that question? Well, Partly to help address that matter, the primates meeting in 2002 recognized that the unwritten law common to the churches of the Anglican Communion and expressed as shared principles of canon law may be understood to constitute a fifth instrument of unity in the communion. And they requested that a statement of principles be prepared. Well, following work by Norman Doe and the Communion's Legal Advisors Network. In 2008, the Anglican Communion Office published this, the principles of canon law common to the churches of the Anglican Communion. In it, there are 100 principles which were agreed, each composed of several sub-principles. And uh, as uh, Sister Helen has said, I was asked to chair the committee that revised the principles uh, to take account of more recent legislation, and the uh, latest edition was presented to the Lambeth Conference last year. So as an example, principle 15 is entitled Ecclesial Polity, and the ninth of the 14 sub-principles reads, so this is 15.9, bishops, clergy, and laity of a church 
share authority in synodical government. Now, those words that I've just read out are not found in the law of any one church. Instead, they express a principle which has been induced from examining laws of the Anglican churches. The principle, all the principles, are descriptive, whereas, of course, the laws from which they are derived are prescriptive. And the authority of the principles comes solely from the fact that they reflect the legislative activity of over 40 autonomous churches across the communion. And I think the remarkable thing is the amount of commonality that we find in the principles. And their existence allows us to make statements about Anglican canon law and allow me to try and answer the question of what is synodality in the Anglican canonical tradition. So I'm going to look at the different levels of synodical government, how they work and what their purposes are. But first, I just want to mention two principles that are important to the constitution of Anglican synods, and those principles are episcopacy and lay participation. Principle 15.10 says episcopacy is fundamental to church polity. So our synodical structures don't replace episcopal structures, they stand alongside them. We've heard a little uh, as um, to how synods are organized as cameral systems, and a general synod includes a house of bishops where the diocesan bishops are not representatives, but they're by virtue of office. And the constitution of the synods often include special provisions um, acknowledging the nature of episcopacy. So, for example, in the Church of England, the House of Bishops of the General Synod has special powers relating to doctrine, liturgy, sacraments, and the right to amend legislation as it sees fit before it's proposed. In some churches, such as in Wales, the law specifically precludes synodical interference in the powers and functions inherent in the office of metropolitan or diocesan bishop. And that second, uh, as it were, constitutional principle is participation of the laity. And it, again, it's something that uh, Will spoke a little bit about. And that's principle 22.1, that lay people are entitled to participate in the governance of the church. There are conditions as to eligibility and selection with, for example, communicant status being the normal requirement for membership in the assemblies of the church. I'm now going to describe the common canonical features of assemblies at the parish, deanery, diocesan, provincial, and national or regional levels of the church. So to begin with the parish, almost everywhere in the Anglican communion, there is a parish assembly. That's principle 21.4. It consists of clergy and laity chaired by the priest in charge of the parish. And usually decisions that belong to the assembly are made by majority vote. Of course, many decisions belong to the parish priest. But generally, the functions of the parish assembly include cooperating with the priest in the mission of the church, pastoral, evangelistic, social, and ecumenical, 21.6. Parish assembly considers matters of religious or public interest, but does not declare the church's doctrine. It's involved with wider church governance through reporting and election, and has responsibilities for finance. Now, the next level above the parish is the deanery level, but only in a few Anglican churches does this level exist, such as Wales and Ireland. The majority of churches don't have the deanery level of synods, so it doesn't appear in the principles. Where it exists, the deanery synod has relatively few legal powers. It's mainly there for the purposes of discussion and planning. So in my own deanery, it's composed of a dozen rather small and rural parishes, and through the deanery, we're able to cooperate and organize things such as 
pilgrimages and youth work, which would really be beyond the means of most of the smaller churches acting uh, individually. The next level is the diocesan synod, and this is composed of the diocesan bishop and representatives of the clergy and laity. And uh, I think, again, Will may have said, in some churches, the diocesan synod is a legislative body, but not in all. The task of the diocesan synod is to advance the mission of the church. So, for example, in Papua New Guinea, the first purposes of the synod is to bring all people in the diocese to a living faith in their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The bishop consults the synod. The diocesan synod doesn't declare the doctrine of the church. It has a certain oversight of parishes. It considers what's referred to it from higher levels. It appoints an executive body that can act when the synod is not in session. And the diocesan bishop may give or withhold consent to proposed diocesan legislation. Above the diocesan level, we have the provincial level. And dioceses associate in ecclesiastical provinces in accord with the ancient usages of the church. And at the provincial synod, the metropolitan presides. That's in principle 39. Now in some churches, uh, larger ones such as Australia and Canada, the provincial synod has a significant role, deliberative and legislative. And in these churches, it can be a complex matter to determine what decisions belong to the diocesan, the provincial, or the general synod. Elsewhere, such as in the Church of England, the two provinces of Canterbury and York almost always act together in the general synod. And then the, the highest level of synods, properly speaking, uh, is the national or regional, which the principles uh, refer to as the central assembly of the church. And that assembly, it may be national, but it may extend across national boundaries, as in the case of the Anglican Church of Southern Africa or the Church of Ireland. The central assembly has a very significant role in Anglican polity, and it's often termed the general synod. The House of Bishops includes all diocesan bishops, as I've said, and sometimes other bishops. The clerical and lay houses are formed of representatives, and the primate presides. Now, whereas, as I've tried very briefly to explain, those lower levels of synod are strictly defined in their powers, the power of a general synod is recognized as general. It takes significant responsibility for constitutional matters, liturgy, ecumenical relationships, central finances, and so on. General synods frequently consult the lower levels of the church. In, in some places, such as Rwanda, any formal legislation by the general synod must be preceded by consultation with the dioceses. In other places, such as South India, the diocesan synods must uh, vote uh, in majority for any proposed legislation. And in yet other places, such as Central Africa, the diocesan synods have no role in central legislation. Again, there's an executive committee to do the work um, when the synod is not in session and other councils and committees are formed. In some churches, membership of a higher level synod automatically entails membership of all the lower levels. And I just note in passing that to be an active member of a general synod, diocesan synod, deanery synod, and parish church council is quite a time commitment, especially for lay people who may have demanding professional or family lives. And I would say, as others have alluded to, that there is, properly speaking, no global level in the sense of an Anglican global synod, as we've heard nothing with jurisdiction. In the case of the Lambeth Conference, uh, all bishops of the communion, all serving bishops, um, take part, but there is uh, no involvement of the laity. The Anglican Consultative Council does include representatives of bishops, clergy, and lay people, but uh, they're all representatives. Again, it, it isn't like a synod on those other levels. So I, 
the, the last part of what I want to talk about is the purposes of synodical government. Why do we have synodical government? What do the principles tell us about that? Well, the principles tell us that synodical government promotes the accountability of those who exercise authority in the church, 16.4, accountability. Principle 18.1 tells us that syn synodical government is the means by which representation of the clergy and people is included in church structures, so representation. Synodical government seeks to ensure that the gifts of God in leadership and authority are not neglected, principle 16.1. Uh, and indeed, in the words of a Church of England report, synodical government is based upon the recognition of the many diverse gifts graciously given to God's people to be used cooperatively to his glory and for the salvation of humanity. The cooperation of all parts of the church in its government is a sign of the church's unity. That's principle 16.6, .6, unity. And then the final purpose is um, subsidiarity. Principle 19, as uh, uh, Sister H Helen mentioned, that's my doctoral research, which isn't yet finished, so you will have to wait a little before you can, you can read it. Subsidiarity, so I'm going to conclude by just mentioning a few thoughts about subsidiarity. It's a principle which Anglicans recognize in the documents of Catholic social teaching. Indeed, Anglican commitment to subsidiarity predates the coining of that term because, as Pope Pius XI stated in Quadragesimo Anno, it is a most weighty principle which cannot be set aside or changed, which remains fixed and unshaken in social philosophy. Anglicans apply much of this thinking from social philosophy also to the governance of the church. In 1998, the Lambeth Conference resolved that a central authority should have a subsidiary function, performing only those tasks which cannot be performed at a more immediate or local level, provided that these tasks can be adequately performed at such levels. According to this resolution, tasks properly belong to those most local appropriate levels, so it's only when they can't be adequately done there those tasks should be performed at higher levels. From its very first meeting in 1867, the Lambeth Conference has addressed questions of what we now call subsidiarity, reporting, for example, that the provincial synod should deal with questions of common interest to the whole province and with those that affect the communion of the dioceses with one another and the rest of the church, while the diocesan synods should be free to dispose of matters of local interest and to manage the affairs of the dioceses. And this principle has been explicitly adopted into the law of some churches, showing the long-standing commitment in Anglican polity toward favoring the local. Now, where decisions are made at local levels, there is, of course, diversity and complexity, from a certain point of view, untidiness. But if the principle of subsidiarity is to be applied to the church, it would seem, to a greater or lesser extent, this is necessarily the result local bodies make decisions appropriate to their locality. But I think that the principles demonstrates that subsidiarity does not mean chaos. Very recognizable patterns of church order are still present amid the variety of practices. And the diversity of practices allows churches to learn from one another. For example, parish assemblies, one of the things I've mentioned, are a relatively late addition to Anglican polity, yet they've been adopted across the communion as churches learn from one another, asking what works, what serves the mission of the church. A recurring difficulty in our synodical system is to discern at what level a given decision properly lies. Take, for example, safeguarding, which has very properly become a central concern of the churches. In the Church of England, we're asking, should responsibility for safeguarding lie at diocesan level primarily or national level? In parts of Australia, formal responsibility for safeguarding has been discerned to be best lie neither at national nor diocesan, but instead at provincial level. When the Anglican Communion first began to debate the ordination of women, again, part of that discernment was understanding at what level such decisions should and could be made. 
Could one church of the Anglican Communion alone make such a decision? Was it a matter properly for the whole communion? And what about ecumenical considerations, the church Catholic beyond the Anglican Communion itself? Legal autonomy implied that an individual church could make such a decision, but should it do so? When some churches began to ordain women as priests and later bishops, this introduced an element of impairment um, into the uh, communion of Anglicanism. Not every priest and bishop was recognized by every church. To some, this untidiness seemed to strike at the very heart of ecclesial identity. For others, it was the appropriate expression of subsidiarity. Today, the Church of England is a part of the Anglican Communion, which does ordain women as bishops and priests. But this has not led to the ejection of those who can't accept that decision, or the decision of the synodical majority. If a parish assembly in England resolves that its parish is unable to accept the ministry of women as priests and bishops, they can petition the Dos and Bishop for arrangements to be made for the parish to receive ministry in accordance with its theological conviction. In my view, this demonstrates that even amid serious disagreement, synodality, in its widest sense, walking together, remains possible. Finally, legal autonomy, the making of decisions at the most local appropriate level, are only one side of the principle of subsidiarity, the so-called negative principle. The positive principle of subsidiarity, on the other hand, gives a positive role to those higher levels of government, saying that they should provide assistance to the lower levels. Thus, a general synod may financially support churches in poorer urban areas. Another form of assistance from a higher level to a lower level may take the form of legislation on matters such as safeguarding or liturgy, ensuring that parishes are places where the vulnerable are protected and sound doctrine is taught. It's this last form of assistance, legislative, which is one that the Anglican instruments of communion cannot provide to the member churches. The legal autonomy of the member churches entails they are subject to no formal canonical jurisdiction at a communion level. We lack a universal jurisdiction, a universal primacy. In a sense, therefore, I would say that in our mental picture of these levels of synodality, we shouldn't view the instruments of communion as sitting at a level above the member churches, but as walking alongside them. The positive, assistant which, the positive assistance which the instruments of communion can provide to the member churches are principally those of prayer, encouragement, and journeying together. In other words, of synodality. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. I was just thinking, oh, this is a model for me for my lecture next year <laughs> on social, Anglican social thought. <laughs> this wonderful combination of finding these uh, underlying principles but also showing the diversity is wonderful. Thank you so much. So now we go to our final speaker in our panel today, um, who has this wonderful long curriculum, because he has this wonderful long oh, ministry. Sister, cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll edited just mention it. one or two things. He, he's, our, he's our only bishop on this panel. He was consecrated bishop in 1996 in Stafford, and he knows some of the Dominican sisters, because there's a big group of Dominican sisters who are based in, in that area. He's also been chairman, secretary, member, consultant, so practically every role in the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commissions, the first, the second, and now the third. He's also had European roles, president of the Conference of European Churches, um, and of course has been in the House of Lords, and it's interestingly mentioned here, spokesperson or spokesman on European affairs from 2009 to 2013. So I think a wonderful figure to talk to us about the topic that's been assigned to him the pastoral approach to Anglican communion and synodality. Thank you very much. Thank you, sister. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, my brief is to speak of the pastoral aspects of Anglican synodality and also 
in my written brief uh, a, a personal aspect, I suppose, because I, I, I'm, a bit, I'm an Anglican bishop. Right, good. So and I'm going to speak, as has been said, mainly about the Church of England. And my colleagues, Archdeacon Will Adam and the Reverend uh, Russell Dewhurst, have covered wider Anglican matters. Um, and I will, there will be a little bit of repetition, but you'll see why from my personal and a pastoral aspect. And of course, uh, enormously grateful to uh, Dr. Paul Avis this morning for setting synodality, Anglican synodality, in its proper conciliar context and the discussion we had about that. Nevertheless, one generalization. Anglican synods, other than the Lambeth Conference, um, and that's not technically a synod anyway, but Anglican synods are usually uh, pastoral and deliberative, and some of them are legislative. So Anglican synods do have a deliberative quality. And there's sometimes tension between deliberation, making definite decisions, and the pastoral side of synodality. I will begin very practically right at the base and already Russell has touched on this. Every parish in England has a parochial church council. I shall use the acronym PCC for that. Though where several parishes are joined together, which is often the case in very rural areas, under one priest, there can be an overall PCC. Won't go into the technicalities of that, different ways of doing it. Although PCCs are not called synods, they do partake of, in my view, synodality. Their membership is regulated nationally by representation rules, and they are elaborate. And these are regularly updated, adopted, and developed at the national level by the General Synod. All parish priests or clergy linked to the parish are ex officio members by reason of their office as priest. The parish priest holds the chair, but a layperson is elected vice chair. Business, as has already been said, is conducted generally by majority vote. Overall, the intention is that of, and I'm using, uh, almost quoting here, mutual cooperation and support with joint, joint decision making. Priest and people have a legal duty, a canonical duty, I quote, to consult together. That's part of the official mandate. On matters of general concern and importance in the parish. A PCC cannot decide a doctrinal question, but certain liturgical options within the parish concerning the use of either the traditional liturgy of the Church of England, the prayer book, or services of more revised liturgies can be decided, are decided, by priest and people together, though there are some options remaining appropriately uh, to the parish priest in his domain or her domain. In theory, this is a local form of synodality. And now, and throughout my paper, I'm going to give you the downside to Anglican synodality as well. In practice, PCCs are, I believe, genuinely synodal, though, wait for it, a domineering parish priest can effectively ignore the consultative intention of PCC legislation. Shock horror. Roman Catholics will recognize the father says so syndrome. But business management evangelicals, and I use the word evangelical not in the continental sense of confession, but in the English sense of the style of theology of a more reformation and sometimes charismatic churchmanship. But sometimes business management evangelicals with a spirit certainty that God is speaking directly to them and nobody else. Um, and they are certain they are leaders are also to be found and they run roughshod through all the rules too. A bishop can be appealed to on certain matters from uh, the people in a parochial church council, mainly liturgical. But this very rarely happens. And I never had such an appeal when I was Bishop of Guildford. I sometimes rather relished one, but uh, anyway. In the Church of England, there are also, as has been said, deanery synods. But that's not um, 
a generalization for the communists, as Russell has said. Um, these deanery synods are comprised of a number of parishes. For example, about 12, but the number can vary. It can be many more than that, and in some cases fewer. All parish clergy are members. This synod is bicameral, two houses, clergy, laity. Deanery synods have joint chairs. The relevant area or rural dean and also an elected lay chair. They may consider any matters of religious or public interest and formulate common policies in relation to parishes, including the discussion of the financial contribution of each parish to their diocese. An archdeacon has to sometimes come into this sort of thing. All the time. All the time. So. <laughs> they are also to communicate diocesan policy or decisions, as well as national decisions from the general synod. They may not declare doctrine. Like PCCs, much depends on how synodal the clerical chair is. There's also a problem because parishes, PCCs, um, uh, rather uh, annual parochial meetings, elect the lay membership of the deanery synod. And most parishioners, I now live in the deep country, are more concerned about their own parish, surprise, surprise, parochialism, and elections are conducted from the parish by an annual uh, parish parochial church meeting for all the parish officers. And the parish officers are first in the election process, usually anyway. And then, finally, election to the deanery synod. Often, the elected person to the deanery synod is a reluctant candidate, perhaps for the reasons that has been said on time and etc. And PCCs do not always want to hear the report from the deanery synod. The exception to this is when there is a discussion of pastoral reorganization. In the Church of England, pastoral reorganization is in inverted commas. And it usually means, uh, you're not hearing this, Archdeacon, it usually means discussion about a contracting number of paid parish priests. Then the deanery synod gets interested. Are we going to lose our parish? Are we going to lose our vicar archdeacon? Inevitably. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We could work together very well. <laughs> Are we going to lose our parish priest, our vicar? I shall come back to deanery synods in a more positive light later on, in terms of listening to each other, which is the theme we began with prayer this morning. The bishop, of course, is only occasionally present for either PCCs or deanery synods. He or she is, of course, always present at the diocesan synod. The Church of England canons on diocesan bishops begin thus. Every bishop is the chief pastor of all that are in within their diocese, as well laity as clergy. The bishop in the Anglican tradition is not just pastor pastorum. She or he is that but also pastor of all the chief pastor of, of the whole diocese. And the canon says their father in God. That's canon 18, 1. So the pastoral and synodal inevitably and quite rightly come together in the office of the bishop um, inseparably. And that's manifested in two ways, obviously. The bishop presiding at the Eucharist for their diocese, representatively speaking, because it's very rare, well, it's never the case that every lay member of the diocese can come together for a, a, a Eucharist, but there are a number of representative occasions. The bishop presiding at the Eucharist, often, but not necessarily, in their cathedral, but also the bishop presiding at the diocesan synod. On occasion, the two rightly go together. The Eucharist preceding or concluding a diocesan synod, making that synod explicitly as well as implicitly Eucharistic. The bishop, and I quote, has the legal duty to consult their diocesan synod. It's not an option. The bishop has to consult the diocesan synod. 
A diocesan synodal tradition is not, of course, unique to either Anglicans or the Church of England, and we've heard much about that already this morning. As uh, Paul Avis has expressed it, um, this is part of the conciliar, wider conciliar synodal tradition of the Church, going back to the patristic area and, and not least the conciliar movement. However, we hear of it regularly, this earlier tradition, in the history of the Church in England prior to the Reformation. Just one example is the reform initiated by Archbishop Lanfranc, that's 1089, one of uh, William the Conqueror's reforming bishops, Archbishop Lanfranc, in his constitutions, regular diocesan synods were to be held twice a year, a diocesan twice a year. All clergy to attend, interestingly, usually um, accompanied um, uh, by their clerk, their parish clerk, who was also to bring parchment and ink, presumably to make sure that the parish priest didn't forget what the bishop had ordained. The pattern was a synodal mass in the cathedral um, and then debate and discussion and the diocesan synod. After the Reformation, there continued to be occasional diocesan synods, though by the 19th century, their status as synods was questioned. We've had that touched on already. Could they make canons or not? The title Diocesan Conference was then preferred in the Church of England by reason of the then legal uncertainty as to whether a diocesan synod could promulge canons without infringing the royal prerogative. I've mentioned monarchy already this morning. But the diocesan conference also came with, for the first time, representative laity. So the diocesan conference added the lay element to uh, the diocesan synodal history. Today in the Church of England, a diocesan synod comprises, of course, House of Bishops, House of Clergy, House of Laity, we've heard that. The bishops are the diocesan bishops, together with any auxiliary, we usually call them suffragan bishops, any auxiliaries or suffragans. The diocesan bishop is ex officio, president of the synod, though they do not always need to chair it and can delegate the chair. Generally, there are one or two exceptions, all three houses must assent for a matter to be accepted. In the House of Bishops in the diocese, if there are equal votes, the diocesan has a casting vote. So there's a, a, the dice is weighted towards the diocesan within uh, uh, the House of Bishops within a diocese. And the bishop can always ask for their opinion on any matter to be formally recorded alongside the actual decision of the synod. The purpose of the diocesan synod is to consider all matters relating to the diocese or public interest. In addition, it may advise the bishop on any matters on which the bishop may consult it. And remember, the bishop has the duty of consultation. And it must also deal with any matters sent from the general synod nationally. It also has to agree by a majority of other dioceses in the Church of England um, uh, to any ecumenical schemes in relation to or with other churches. And we have Porvo churches uh, here present, and the Porvo agreement in the Church of England had to go through all the diocesan synods first, and with a majority. Crucially and deliberatively, it considers the annual budget of the diocese, and the annual accounts of a statutory finance committee. So finance and the diocesan synod cannot be separated. The agenda is set by the bishop's council, which is also the synod standing committee, whose clerical and lay members are also elected, the diocesan ex officio. No doctrinal statement may be issued. Other diocesan structures also exist of some importance, the Diocesan Board of Education, church schools, where there are church schools in, in, uh, in all our dioceses in England, and also um, uh, boards for uh, clergy housing issues and property issues, um, and of course a board of finance. But the diocesan synod is the chief place where the bishop and diocese listen to the voices of the church and make decisions. Let me now be more personal. 
Traditionally, Church of England dioceses have been uh, very diversified uh, structures. The more the diversification, uh, the less coherence there is, or sometimes mutual trust. The question is, who makes the decisions and where? So the more bodies there are, the more obscure that question is uh, in any organisation, uh, maybe even the Vatican. In recent years, diocesan synods have become more clearly the focus of diocesan decision-making, with a very considerable role enhanced, in my view, of the Bishop's Council in terms of setting the agenda and enabling the diocese to listen to itself, to walk together on the way. The Bishop's Council can be a place where the bishop really does learn what the laity think. When I was in Guildford, I reorganised the Bishop's Council, Bishops, Clergy and Laity, as a kind of Senate. That's not an official word, but as a kind of Senate. In addition, it is customary for the bishop to deliver a, what is called a charge, or opening speech to the Synod. I use this device regularly, and I'm aware that most other bishops in the Church of England do as well. The bishop chooses a topical issue, ecclesiastical, social, economic, or moral, to open up a discussion, discussion in the synod, but not necessarily with any deliberative resolution attached to it, rather to begin a Christian conversation. Now we move from synod to synodality. After a bishop's charge, there's always discussion, extended questions, comment, disagreement, sometimes differing from the bishop, but contributing to a synodal decision. Uh, sorry, a synodal discussion, not necessarily a decision. I look back on the charges I gave, given my mandate to be personal, and I picked up one for 2012, because it was literally entitled Walking Together on the Way, an exploration of synodality. That was the title I used, 2012. The two disciples were arguing along the road, I told the Emmaus story. But in the end, they recognised Christ in the breaking of the bread, the risen Christ. I then touched on the contemporary 2012 debate in the Church of England about women bishops. And also, we've heard it already, on the proposed covenant, the Anglican covenant for the communion in the light of Anglican divisions worldwide on questions of human sexuality. The latter and still today, of course, a deeply divisive topic. I also pledged better communication between the Bishops' Council and the Synod on strategic planning for the diocese. I concluded with these words, let us bring this, these discussions, to the table of the Lord in our concluding Eucharist. The Synod finished with a diocesan Eucharist. Now, I'm not trying to be personally triumphalistic. Um, Synods have problems, as I shall relate in a few moments' time, or Anglican synods do. One problem with Church of England diocesan synods is that not all parishes are represented either by clergy or laity. Now, this is not the case in most other parts of the communion. The Church of England, a priest in the diocese, is not necessarily a member of the diocesan synod. Now, the older diocesan conference I referred to included all licensed that's active, clergy and lay representatives from all the parishes. But, as synodical government was reformed, in large dioceses, this meant a very large unwieldy gatherings. So when diocesan centers were created, the clergy elected representatives. Now the clergy know each other and can usually make appropriate choices. The laity of a diocese do not all know each other. So the electoral constituency for the laity in the Church of England Diocesan Synod is the House of Laity of the Deanery Synod. And that's, in my view, the, one of the weak links. You'll recall my anxiety about how effective the election of lay members to Deanery Synods were. And they are the constituency for the House of Laity for the diocese. So the big question is how does the church effectively give voice to the laity. There's no Anglican perfect panacea. Work is still in progress, where ecumenical learning is, is needed. Turning to the General Synod, 
we also see the same question arising. The general synod or national synod comprises, of course, three houses referred, bishops, clergy and laity. It is constituted by the ancient bicameral convocations of Canterbury and York, bishops and elected clergy. And the election of clergy goes back to before the Reformation. Um, uh, originally uh, in the convocations, uh, it was the archdeacons who were kind of ex officio representatives of the so-called lower clergy. Uh, and, and cathedrals were represented. And then there were forms of election, owing to something to the Dominican tradition. I, I think uh, uh, that's a, a theory, but um, uh, I'm not the only person to, to, to say that. Um, so, yes. Convocations, Canterbury, York, bishops, and elected clergy. To which, as has already been explained, uh, in, uh, from 1919 was added uh, a house of laity. House of laity is also elected by each diocese, as are the clergy. And there are certain ex officio members, which I won't go into. The two archbishops, the two primates of Canterbury and York, one the primate of England and the other primate of all England, that precedence was a papal decision. Um, the two archbishops are joint presidents and delegate the role of chair for most of the business, but not all. It is a legislative and deliberative body, designedly so, as it replaces, largely, the earlier government of the Church of England by the Westminster Parliament. The, any matter which uh, 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 would have gone to a parliamentary act now comes through a measure, and there is a scrutiny by Parliament, uh, which I won't go into the details of, but there's still a scrutiny by Parliament. So the General Synod considers all matters um, and can make provision for this by measures, which are the equivalent of Acts of Parliament, by canons, which have to have a royal assent still, and other orders or regulation. For important matters, voting is by houses and has to be passed by the bishops, clergy, and laity. As has already been said, doctrinal and liturgical questions can only be presented in a form previously approved by the House of Bishops. So the Episcopal role is, we believe, um, preserved properly. For these and certain other matters, a two-thirds majority is required in each House. A two-thirds majority, and the Synod can agree a higher majority for some matters, is a conscious reflection of a conciliar and canonical concern for consensus. And there are canonical... Uh, pre-Reformation canonical pre precedents for uh, having a, a, a significant majority on the line towards consensus. But one of the drawbacks of the General Synod and Church of England is that it is thought of as the Church's Parliament, and in a certain sense it is. But Parliament has a government and an opposition, and an Act of Parliament is passed with even a bare majority. So apart from those important exceptions that I've mentioned, most synod business is conducted with a simple majority. Oh, right, thank you. Some time ago, a, a, a bishop who also happened to be the co-chair of ARCIC commented on the fact that when the synod legal adv officer advised that a vote was to take place, they used the same term as parliament. They called the synod to divide. Well, that's changed in terminology, but there's still a question of division. Um, there are also some other tensions. Uh, there are churchmanship tensions, but also, um, and at the moment, that's liberal and conservative over sexuality questions. And there's also sometimes a rather nasty um, feel of the clergy and laity being the opposition to Episcopal government. But synod is not about government and opposition. Anyway, um, I'm going to conclude with um, uh, one example of how synods can uh, sometimes, from my personal experience, uh, avoid this politicization. It goes back to when I was Bishop of Stafford in the Staffordshire Moorlands, the beginning of the Pennine Hills which divide northeast and northwest England. It's a remote upland area of small villages and subsistence farming. Sociologically, it is a conservative rural area. Economically, it is poor. The area dean asked me to talk to the synod on the issue of same-sex relations. This was significantly not quite the same debate we're having now, 
It was the time when Parliament, government was considering civil partnerships, civil same-sex partnerships. So I respected the question that my area dean put to me, but I rather regretted he asked it but me, but I felt I had to say yes, talk about it. But if I were to offer a magisterial charge, some would agree and some would disagree. Surprise, surprise. More importantly, I was certain that I as a bishop, this is over 20 years ago, had not had time to discern a true mind in the wider church, let alone, let alone pronounce a consensus. Discernment takes much time and much listening. Much listening first, much discernment. In any case, it's not for a single bishop in a diocese to discern what the truth of the matter might eventually be. But if I were to bring in two advocates, one advocating liberal change, the other uh, opposing change, we'd still have an oppositional uh, deanery synod. And uh, some would say yes and some say no. So instead, I arranged first that the laity and clergy should not sit together in their parish groupings, but be dispersed, so that individually strong-minded clergy could not dominate their parishioners. After wise advice from a bishop skilled in group dynamics, I set the synod a series of questions to which each member was asked to respond by a graded score, starting, if you like, from terms of disapproval, minus three, minus two, minus one, or zero, which is neutral, plus one, plus two, plus three, various degrees of approval. We began with a very easy question, well, relatively easy. Their view on an unmarried, heterosexual couple, nevertheless wanting their child baptised. Then various forms of heterosexual promiscuity, and then onto similar homosexual activity, such as clubbing, going to nightclubs, with the purpose of, I'm using slang, one night stands, um, picking up uh, a partner uh, uh, for uh, promiscuity. Now, this behavior was equally condemned, whether of heterosexual couples or homosexual couples. But conversely, and this was the sort of last question, how would they respond to a same-sex couple who wanted to be regular members of the local parish church? And on this, the range of responses was fascinating, not predictable. Very interesting indeed. There were some who still found that objectionable, but not at the strongest degree. But there were also others who found it much more positive. The members were sitting at round tables with the result that they talked to each other about the situation and listened to each other's experiences. We didn't vote on a final score. It wasn't our task to reach a final decision. Afterwards, one old farmer came up to me and said... I won't try and do a North Staffordshire accent. Um, you know, Bishop, well, a slight accent, you have, have. There have always been a few folk like that in every village and every family. You have to live with them and love them. That synod didn't resolve the issue. This issue is still with us, and we are in the middle of a great debate in the Church of England as the communion. But... I believe that there are ways, even of a formal synod, acting in a, a, a more interestingly synodal way. And the Church of England, through living in uh, 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 love and faith, is going through that at the very moment. And in the wider communion, the so-called Indaba process is another way of listening to each other. As you listen, that example is a very first slow step. But what we have to do is to listen to census for day with a view very long term with much argument and much strife perhaps to an eventual consensus for Dalium. I've run over my time sister, thank you I apologise. Thank you very much I think it's, it's a lovely place for us to end because we had some history, we had some canonical stuff but we had all the personal story which can bring the whole thing alive and, and I think it's a great place to finish. So now I'd like to call upon Father Martin Brown who is um, one of the officials in the dicastery for promoting 
Christian unity here in Rome. He's a monk of Glenstall Abbey in, in Ireland, a Benedictine monk, to ask him to give uh, his listening response. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so I want to begin by sincerely thanking uh, Will Adam, Russell Dewhurst and Bishop Christopher Hill for their very clear and helpful presentations. Following the excellent historical and theoretical exposition earlier from Paul Avis, it was good to have these three historical, canonical and personal and pastoral presentations just now. Uh, my role is very much to listen, uh, to reflect back what I heard, uh, not to ask difficult questions. That, that's, that's for you to do afterwards, so I, I will be as brief as I can to leave plenty of time for questions from the floor. Um, I think it was very good that uh, despite the presence of uh, a batch of Englishmen as the speakers, that they all reminded us uh, of the breadth of the Anglican Communion, uh, of its internationality, and of, uh, of the richness and challenges that that brings. So, as we listen, I think the temptation, and listening is important, because I think the temptation for Catholics might be and I think it's true with regard to most, if not all, of the churches of the rest in ter terms of the Catholic reaction uh, to the, uh, all the other churches. The temptation would be to say that Anglicanism's structure and constitution is so different, so varied, and the range of places where authority is located is so dispersed. Uh, we might be tempted to think that it, is, it has little to teach or share with the Catholic Church in terms of synodality. And I think that our speakers have shown that this would be uh, very much an inaccurate conclusion to reach. And it seems to me that the principal thing that Catholics can learn from Anglican experience in this area is the importance of embedding synodal and conciliar structures and processes in the permanent lived reality of the church. Uh, we in the Catholic Church have long had a very beautiful theology of the people of God, uh, of the universal call to holiness, of the holy people of God sharing in Christ's prophetic office. But we haven't been as good at reflecting that in our structures. Nearly 60 years after Lumen Gentium, things like parish pastoral councils and parish financial councils are still not present in all parishes. Meaningful diocesan structures have been ever even slower to evolve. And I think until the current uh, synodal process was announced a few years ago, national ecclesial assemblies were very rare indeed, at least in the last 100 years. I think it was good uh, to get the historical perspective from Paul Avis earlier because we, we can kind of forget that there's a history uh, that, that precedes us and it's good to, to, to re reconnect with it. Our panelists have been very honest about the limitations of Anglican synodal processes and practices, from the tendency towards parliamentary style uh, confrontationism and uh, parliamentary divisions, um, to the potential for unrepresentative membership or, God help us, uh, clerical dominance. And so certainly we should uh, avoid exaggerating uh, how so much better Anglicans do everything. But nevertheless, the fact that parish, deanery, and diocesan and national assemblies are really part of Anglican DNA is definitely, I think, something for Catholics uh, to look at and learn from. How can we involve laity in decision-making in a way that doesn't uh, destroy how we understand the church? I was musing, and, I, and it's not a very worked out thought, but uh, the fact that Pope Francis uh, in the current uh, constitution for the Roman Curia uh, seems to have uh, separated the exercise of authority in the church uh, from the uh, power of or ordained ministry uh, might trickle down into how we look at the exercise of authority and decision making in other parts of the church, not just in the Curia, but that's, that's a thought for another day. Catholics are currently dealing with many ecclesiological, canonical, and sacramental questions about that issue of the exercise of the power of governance in the church, and how far attempts at greater inclusion in decision-making can go without compromising the church's theological coherence. And we saw something of this as late as this week with a letter of the heads of three 
uh, Vatican de Castries to the German bishops about their plans for a permanent council after their uh, current synodal process comes to an end. Yeah. I was very struck by the idea that uh, for many Anglicanism, uh, Anglican uh, entities, uh, the diocese is seen very much not just in the liturgy presided over by the bishop in the cathedral, which is very much how the uh, Catholic understanding of, of, of the local church is embodied, but also by the bishop in the diocesan synod, the bishop in synod. And so the idea that uh, the church is most visible not only when it gathers around the bishop at the altar, but when it gathers around the bishop uh, in the synod hall, I think is, is something that is also very useful for us uh, to, to look at and to, to learn from. The word consultation can often be an excuse, and I think Bishop Christopher got, got to this too, uh, to go through the motions of letting people have their say without really uh, taking it on board. So that, of course, is the, the great challenge. How do we learn uh, to make consultation real? How do we le learn to make consultation uh, contribute to actual decision making, even if it's not canonically the forum uh, for, for d deliberation and legislation? So how can we do that uh, in a way that does not uh, diminish the role and the sacramental understanding of the church and the role of the bishop? And I think here, it's not so much a matter of learning, but maybe relearning, uh, and relearning from Anglicanism's appropriation of our shared heritage of conciliarity. Uh, those structures have been more robustly retrieved and embodied in the Ang Anglican tradition than in the uh, Catholic one. So I think uh, those kind of questions uh, and the examples we've seen today have really uh, opened up room for us to question ourselves and to learn from. As Archic 3 has sought to explore questions of subsidiarity, the relationship between the global church and the national church, and between the national church and the dioceses and parishes, and the appropriate level for particular things and particular kinds of decision making, are really live ones in the Catholic church right now. Right now. And when the use of synodical instruments is only an occasional occurrence, which I know isn't fully the case for us, but it seems to that sometimes, those kind of occasional synodical experiences inevitably cause anxiety or fear uh, on one end of the church, or they can become the focus for unreasonable and frankly unecclesial expectations and activism on the other. But if these instruments can be embedded into the ordinary permanent life of the church in ways that are meaningful and effective without departing from or distorting the hierarchical ordering of the people of God. That really should be something that we Catholics should learn from and try to emulate. So while being realistic about the potential pitfalls, I think that our panelists have shown us that Anglicans have much to teach Catholics about how to embody synodality in a structured and enduring way. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Brother Brown. So now we have the chance for a wider discussion. Uh, we've got lunch at one o'clock, but I think we'll stop about 10 minutes before, 15 minutes before. So maybe 15 or 20 minutes now for discussion. If anybody would like to bring up some interesting points, please, Father. I'm Matthew Lafferty from the Methodist Ecumenical Office, Rome. I have, have two questions. The, the, the first one is, is about mutual accountability among the member churches of the Anglican Communion. You, you use the word a, autonomous for churches. I, I think uh, by that you mean self-governing, self-ruling, as our Orthodox siblings might say, autocephalous churches. Um, I think maybe sometimes when, when we hear autonomous churches, we don't think about mutual accountability among churches within the Communion. And so can you talk about what structures may exist, uh, whether formal or, or, or informal, within the communion to provide mutual accountability with, with, within um, the Anglican communion? Um, the other question is around, are there other functions the Archbishop of Canterbury plays within, within, um, within the communion that may, again, be formal or informal? I'm particularly thinking about some 
uh, examples on doctrinal issues within churches on the African continent, which have some unique provisions within them uh, there around consultation when there's disagreement around uh, doctrinal issues within the very specific churches. It's not a policy, but I'm, I'm curious around um, the role the archbishop might play uh, as well in the communion, um, even though he does not have authority within <laughs> other churches beyond, beyond his own. Do you want to answer the archbishop? I'll do the archbishop we, one. We, we think we'll. I'll do the archbishop one first. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is the case that because of the, because of some because of the development of the canon law of the individual churches, some of them still retain in it some reference to the Archbishop of Canterbury. So, uh, for instance, the Church of Ceylon, which is Sri Lanka, it's still called the Church of Ceylon for a particular reason, that they wanted to reserve the title Church of Sri Lanka until they could be a united church and unite with the... Uh, with the other churches there, um, is is small and retains within it the the role of the Archbishop of Canterbury as Metropolitan. So, because um, the Metropolitan uh, of India, Burma, and Ceylon, as it was in um, in the nineteen, they've all changed. India is still called India, isn't it? Uh, in the in the nineteen forties, um, the. the the rest of it all split off, and so uh, Sri Lanka was left. So they, they particularly hold the, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury there as metropolitan. In other places, there's reference in sort of preambles to constitutions, which mention communion with the See of Canterbury. Um, and in other places, there are, as you say, th things that are there uh, which give the Archbishop a particular um, role in, um, in looking at difficult questions. What I would like to say, and this touches on your other, th other question as well, Matthew, is, is, is the, the role of, of diocesan links, which is an informal method both of accountability and of ex an expression of communion, where bishops and clergy and laity have these links around the world, be it, I don't know, South Africa and America or Australia and Tanzania or, or whatever, which which enables people to get to know one another uh, and to produce, if you like, a, an informal um, expression uh, of accountability. And the Archbishop of Canterbury has a particular role in, um, in getting to know personally uh, the churches of the Anglican Communion. The current Archbishop of Canterbury went and visited and stayed in the house of every primate over a period of, um, including Mauritius, uh, over a period of about two years, from 2013 to 2015. So it is largely, as we've all said, um, informal, relational, and persuasive, rather than juridical, jurisdictional, or coercive. Could Christopher add to that? Uh, when I was in Guildford, uh, my mandate being Episcopal and personal, um, we were twinned with, um, amongst other places, with... Um, about five um, Nigerian dioceses. Originally, when the church in Nigeria became uh, independent of Canterbury, um, Guildford and uh, two other dioceses in the southwest, southeast, uh, south of east of England were twinned with the whole of Nigeria and the whole of West Africa. It slimmed down to an active link with five dioceses. So in my time, I went, I think, four times for extended visits to uh, Nigeria. But this was at a time when the, the primate of the Church of Nigeria, um, uh, of the Anglican Church of Nigeria, w was um, uh, uh, dissuading his fellow bishops uh, from coming to a Lambeth conference, and there was a kind of impaired communion. Well, it wasn't a kind, it was an impaired communion. And yet at the d local level, um, uh, a visit, which was a team visit, um, the, um, uh, for a very particular reason, uh, the Anglican Church in Nigeria, as with the Catholic Church in Nigeria, had a vast, a big number of very good uh, schools. They were nationalised by the Nigerian government, then left to rot. No, mo no money was spent on them, and they deteriorated physically. And then finally, the Nigerian government gave the schools back to the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church. But they were, they, they, they deteriorated. And so, 
our education people came over with uh, a visit that I did to try to help in the rebuilding of uh, uh, Anglican church schools in Nigeria. Well, if that isn't an exercise in some form of both synodality and communion, I, I, I don't know what is. And yet, at the official level, we're in strained relationships of communion. I also act as letter carrier for the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, but that's a private matter. <laughs> yeah, um, I was just going to add that, as, as I understand it, Pope Benedict, on his writing about subsidiarity, brought out more strongly the idea that subsidiarity shouldn't be seen just as the relationship between different levels, but the relationships of um, horizontally, exactly bodies on the same level, that they should, um, though they, they don't have jurisdiction over one another, obviously they um, can encourage, help, sustain, bear one another's burdens. And I think that understanding that sort of brotherly accountability, not just to the level above, but to those um, horizontally situated, I think that way of, of understanding can help um, guide the way that the churches of the communion feel they should act. Thank you. Great, thank you for that stimulating question. Yeah, please, we have another one here. Father, Father Christopher, a uh, student here at the Angelicum. Um, you mentioned a number of times uh, the tendency for uh, clerical uh, domination. Um, I was wondering, is there any mechanism, for example, in canon law or just on the practical level when, say, a, a bishop overextends his jurisdiction or the other way around if a, a lay person or a priest or uh, other member of this central process overextends their uh, jurisdiction or their, their level of competency as far as the decision making? Is there something uh, that's mentioned specifically or uh, what can be done practically when this occurs in practice? Thank you. Great. I think there's another question down here. Certainly I think it would be good if we took the question, okay, and then we can, we can deal with both of them. Thank you, Mr. Father. Yes, right. I would like to learn something about the creation of the three system of uh, house of uh, clergy, laity, and, uh, and bishops. Because uh, the Anglican tradition claims to be very faithful to the patristic area. But this patristic era, may I quote Cyprian, the bishop is in the church, and the church is the bishop then I would like to, ask, to learn something about the, the, the discussion between that very modern creation. Great, okay, so we've got these two questions to deal with, however you would like to. Shall we maybe go in the opposite order from okay. this time? Yeah. Well, if I just address briefly the, the, the first question. In the Church of England, um, for, for example, if a priest or a bishop is overreaching the powers that the law gives, then usually, practically speaking, informal mechanisms would be used first. I think an archdeacon would be brought in to assist the um, conversation between the priest and the, and the people. Um, but if, if necessary, there are disciplinary procedures. So both clergy, parish priests, and bishops um, can be subject to formal disciplinary complaints and then there are quite elaborate procedures um, and the grounds of complaint include um, acting contrary to the ecclesiastical law. So if, if a bishop is doing something contrary to the law or, or a priest then practically speaking that, that can happen but as I say um, it's usually handled more informally certainly in the case of, of bishops. Well, that's much more difficult, certainly in the Church of England, because um, historically, for historical reasons probably um, can't go into, um, it's to do with the, the difficulties in England of defining precisely who's a member and um, what penalties can be imposed on lay people. 
there, there are very few formal canonical ways of disciplining lay people, only when they're in certain offices, and even that is very difficult. In other areas of the communion, um, it, um, it, it is more possible, but I, I think Paul alluded to it in his um, first presentation that generally formal discipline um, applies to clergy and not to lay people, so it becomes, can become a difficult pastoral problem. Thank you. I don't know whether, Chris, um, Bishop, would you like to say something to either of these questions? Um, y y I'll have a go, yes. Um, um, uh, just to reinforce what Russell said, um, w w uh, th there are mechanisms for uh, intervention, but um, uh, either way, um, and, and there are mechanisms under certain circumstances for the bishop to be able to suspend uh, a lay officer of the church if they've done something wrong, uh, safeguarding issues, and bankruptcy, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so, so there are some mechanisms, um, but usually the, the archdeacon is sent in by the bishop to sort it out. Do you want to know what I'm doing next Tuesday? Uh, I can guess. <laughs> uh, I had a very difficult case um, when I was in Stafford, um, and uh, the Archdeacon and I at Talon Smith um, uh, handled it between us, and it was both informal and it had to be then formal. But uh, the procedures, once you go to law, canon law or, uh, um, or, or civil law, you've almost lost the battle because of the, you know, the thing gets out of hand and uh, uh, it becomes embittered and sometimes incapable of conciliation, which is difficult. Um, Father Hervé's question about uh, Cyprian. Um, the, I think there is always a danger in choosing just one element of the patristic tradition. <laughs> and, and Anglicans have sometimes strongly claimed Cyprian for some parts of what Cyprian said, but not other parts. Uh, and so, so I, I, I think the, the um, uh, I think I, I would look to the broader conciliarity of the patristic period, and then, as Paul has already said, uh, to the way in which canonists, not least Dominican canonists, worked out um, forms of uh, consultation and deliberation with representatives. So I think uh, we need to take the whole tradition seriously. Thank you. Just one thing to add to what has already been said is that um, there are examples from around the Anglican Communion of disputes of misuse of power being litigated both in internal church tribunals and also then in state courts. So for instance, um, the, there's a, very, a leading case in employment law in England and Wales, which is a judicial review, as we call it, called the Crown against the Bishop of Stafford. It was me. And it was him. Uh, he won. Uh, <laughs> and about, you know, the, poten yeah, the potential for uh, overreaching, but that was litigated in, in, the, in the civil courts um, as a question of whether the bishop had overreached uh, his, his power. There are other examples of bishops and clergy being um, dealt with, as it were, through uh, intra-church tribunals or um, inter, um, church tribunals. I can think of those in Australia, Canada, the United States, um, South Africa. Interestingly, the Lambeth Conference uh, in 1867 uh, was, was called because of a disciplinary um, issue to do with the Bishop of Natal, at the time uh, in the, what was called then the Church of England, um, but in South Africa. Could I just add that I did not initiate the civil uh, uh, law process. Let that be understood by everybody, <laughs> sister. <laughs> okay, so if nobody has any more to say to any answer any either of those questions, I mean, I think we, we could break here. If there's a really burning question that somebody wants to put, we could take a quick one. Otherwise, it just, uh, um, remains for me to thank very warmly all our panelists um, uh, for wonderful, really rich, really thoughtful presentations. Thank also our listener 
and also for your very important participation in the audience. And I think now we are going for lunch probably in the Sala delle Colonne, is that right? Yeah, okay. Okay, okay, group photo first, very important. Okay, just outside here, under the Angelica. Do you want to see a start? Oh, here. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, fine. The lunch will be served in the same uh, Sala Colonne when we ask the break, and we will start this afternoon at 3.30, following the local tradition <laughs> of the break. <laughs> Thank you very much for an uh, important morning. Thank you very much. Look in the distance, still. Ready? <laughs> Don't get run over. 
On est on a beaucoup de choses en commun. Looks like you're lecturing. Yeah, I think that's some good. I wouldn't leave. I wouldn't leave anything you don't want walking away. One, 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 one walked away. No, because normally, yeah, and the students are for class, so at times they pass, and so. Just just any anything will do. They're gonna cut out my head anyway. No, but give them the whole thing. You never know what they'll do. They might choose Thomas Aquinas instead. No, no, I'll just go to the right. Just look, look at Jesus in the distance. I can see Jesus. You got.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Let us let us prepare ourselves to have the second session, and we are really pleased to devote this afternoon to to listen to our brothers and sisters from the Lutheran tradition. I am really pleased and honored to welcome Professor Lothar Vögel. Professor Vögel, uh, he is the Dean of the Valdensian Faculty of Theology in Rome. He is a Lutheran ordained pastor from the Lutheran Church of Wittenberg. I was telling you that we are, we are so happy to, 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 have, uh, to have among us some of the professors that are working and living in Rome on different faculties. So thank you very much, Professor Vogel. And I, I give you all the, the chance to present what is going to happen in this first hour. Yes. Thank you very much. So. Uh, we can open this afternoon session on um, synodality um, from, a, from a Lutheran viewpoint, from a Lutheran approach. Um, uh, we have the little, perhaps you may be disappointed about what I have to say now, but unfortunately, uh, Pastor Anne Burkhardt, who is the General Secretary of the Lutheran World Federation, cannot be physically among us, uh, but she registered her uh, conference, conference, which we will hear, and then there will be um, anyway, the response and so on, as it was uh, uh, foreseen in the program you have uh, in front of us, uh, in front of you. Um, the uh, Reverend Anne Burkhardt is a Lutheran pastor who is coming from Estonia, um, a country with a long Lutheran tradition and an important Lutheran tradition, and from uh, 2021 on, she has been uh, the General Secretary of the Lutheran World Federation, so one of the most important representatives of uh, Lutheranism on global level. And we are um, really happy that she could register for us her presentation, uh, which, which, will, uh, which we will hear nearly immediately, but before giving the word to her or to our techniques. So I was really happy to hear that you have such an, uh, you have persons that only do the technical things because when I was told that uh, there's a registration, I already feared to have a little problem on this level. Um, after uh, this uh, conference from Reverend Anne Burkhardt, we will hear uh, the reaction from Professor Etienne Wette, um, who is uh, teaching theology at the Gregoriana. And um, afterwards, there will also be a discussion. Uh, obviously, uh, the Reverend Burkhardt cannot answer to your observations, but there will be uh, the Reverend Dr. Dirk Lange from the Lutheran World Federation. I saw him before here. He is who can uh, then react to our observations. So thank you also for this. Um, now we can pass to the conference from uh, Reverend Burkhardt, and I would uh, ask you to, to begin with it. Um, 
Ireland, where I am currently visiting the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land, a member church of the Lutheran World Federation, and also our country program in Jerusalem. I regret that I cannot be present at this very engaging conference, Listening to the West, but I am grateful to be able to contribute this reflection on synodality from a Lutheran perspective, taking into account our own processes within the LWF. I will wait with anticipation to learn of the many insights so that we all grow closer in joint proclamation and service as we deepen our ecumenical witness. Thank you to all of you for your presence and engagement in this topic. Synodality has never been absent in the life of the Church, though at times more hidden than instrumental. It has played a role in the life of many faith communities, whether on a local or broader level, as they discern what the Spirit is saying to the Churches. Today, synodality has be, been given a new perspective and role. It is now a question that challenges each one of us, not only in our spiritual life, but in the life of our ecclesial institutions and the ways in which we define and use authority and power. It challenges us to think about the foundation of our faith and how that foundation, that touchstone, so to speak, becomes visible, more visible for all people to see and believe. This new role and attention that synodality has acquired in our day is in large part due to His Holiness Pope Francis. Pope Francis is concerned to embody the insights of Vatican II, to give them real life, a specific form in this third millennium. Synodality means, of course, to walk together and has been defined by Pope Francis as the constitutive way of the Church, the figure that enables us to interpret reality with the eyes and heart of God, the condition for following the Lord Jesus and being servants of life in this wounded time. In walking together, we are able to understand and interpret with God's immeasurable goodness the realities that surround us, we are able to be disciples, followers of Jesus, that is, those who seek life abundant for the whole human family. For Pope Francis, the Synodal Church has four essential characteristics that mark ecclesial life. Listening to the Apostles' teaching, first. Second, the safeguarding of mutual communion. Third, the breaking of the bread and fourth, prayer. He then defines these further as preaching and catechesis grounded in God's word, as community or communion that shields us from selfishness and particularisms, as the breaking of bread, recognizing that Christ walks with us, and prayer. As a Lutheran theologian, I cannot but wholeheartedly assent to these characteristics of a synodal church, as they also constitute a Lutheran understanding of church, and as the LWF, a communion of churches, seeks to embody. I have been asked to reflect on a synodal church from a Lutheran perspective. I will do so in light of an ongoing process of discernment within the LWF and its member churches. I will first offer some distinctions in terminology, considering the dynamic and challenges of synodality. I will then examine Martin Luther's writing more closely, particularly his treatise, The Councils and the Church, from 1539. In his writings, Luther outlines characteristics of councils and the role of the priesthood of all believers. Based on these characteristics, I will then consider the process of mutual accountability within the LWF communion as an expression of synodality and the spiritual discipline synodality presents all of us. 
it is always helpful to begin with distinctions in terminology. Synodality, collegiality, conciliarity appear synonymous, though their usage in certain ecclesial traditions differs. In more recent history, collegiality has referred to a certain form of ecclesial government, whether that be reserved to a college of bishops or other forms of recognized church authority. Collegiality is recognized as an appropriate expression of oversight, episcopal or other, for the sake of the unity of the church extending beyond the diocese, therefore also beyond national boundaries in some cases. In Lutheran churches, such a term does occur, but not commonly. It may occur on the national level to a certain extent through the bishops' conferences and joint synods. However, the development of collegiality among Lutheran bishops beyond the national framework remains a challenge. As the Joint Lutheran Catholic Commission report, the, apostol the apostolicity of the Church has pointed out. It is a challenge because national boundaries are also not to be determinative of the Church. But more on this later. On the other hand, synodality should, I'm not saying it always does, signify both a more narrow and a more broad understanding of covenants than a collegial exercise of ecclesial authority. It encompasses not only regional or national forms of governance, but also local and global forms. Synodality defines a dynamic of discernment active on all levels of the church life. In this sense, it is much harder to distinguish, if at all, from what is meant by concilia. Luther himself does not use the term synodal, but of course writes extensively on councils and concilia characteristics. This perspective highlights a particular dynamic inherent in synodality. Not only does it describe a form of governance, of consultation, of decision-making on different levels of ecclesial life, but it directs the Church towards the spiritual dimension of authority, found not in the exercise of power, as in the world, but in discernment of the way Jesus Christ has continually revealed in history through the Holy Spirit. Synodality holds both the spiritual realm and the political realm in a balance. This situation, of course, can create a certain tension, as we already see in the scripture. It is struggle present in apostolic times between adopted methods of governance and the disruption occasioned by the Spirit. It is the struggle between firmly held definitions of faith, challenged by new paths being forged. Is this not what we see happening in Acts 15 and the Jerusalem Council? A debate had arisen concerning circumcision as a requirement for adherence to the community. Paul and Barnabas had been preaching among the Gentiles and converting many, placing no obligation concerning practices. A decision need, needed to be reached concerning practices in the nascent Christian community and the council was called. Some believers demanded that all converts should be circumcised and adhere to the law of Moses. Was this long-held reference fundamentally a question of identity, to be modified or even abandoned? In Acts 15 verse 7 we read, after there had been much debate. Of course, we do not know all the details of that debate, but we know the conclusion. The whole assembly kept silence and listened. That is, they listened carefully. Then James spoke and shared this decision. No additional burdens should be imposed on Gentile converts. He did, though, add, 
that they should be instructed to avoid unclean foods, fornication, and anything associated with idols. Another decision was then also taken by the whole church to send companions with Paul and Barnabas as witnesses to this important decision. In his letter to the Galatians, Apostle Paul refers to this decision. He emphasizes that in their spiritual decision, the pillars of Jerusalem, James, Peter and John, had recognized the grace obviously given to Paul, as it stands in Galatians 2.9. It was the apostolic council, in fact, that affirms justification by faith as the norm of proclamation of the gospel as the criterion for the identity of the body of Christ. This council has been sometimes considered the model council for the great ecumenical councils that took place in the 4th and 5th centuries. It has certain distinguishing factors, however, that I would like to highlight. First of all, we notice that this council, though occasionally referred to as the first apostolic council, had more participants than simply the apostles. When Paul and Barnabas arrived in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church that included the apostles, the elders, believers, including those believers who insisted on circumcision. It was a gathering of the faithful. It was an assembly that listened and discerned together, allowing James, called as overseer, to make a decision that seemed to the Holy Spirit and to us, as Acts 15, 28 states. The heart of the decision was to proclaim the liberating grace of the gospel. It should also be noted and underlined that the argument Paul and Barnabas made, as well as Peter, was from the experience of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the faithful. But then we might be curious about James' additional ruling that the Gentile believers should nonetheless abstain from certain things. Luther notes that this decision, though not critical to the proclamation of the gospel, nor the most important aspect of this first council, nonetheless shows forth a deep pastoral concern. It is a decision made out of love, not to off offend those weak in faith, or those who still need to cling to certain assurances. We have, according to Luther, a two-part decision. One anchored in faith, the other motivated by love. Finally, here, in this account, we witness the challenge of synodality situated between the spiritual realm and the political realm. The challenge consists precisely in practicing a new form of governance, holding firm to the truth in the midst of continual change. Christ's, Christ's death and resurrection has brought forth new creation, which the Holy Spirit inaugurates and continually broadens and deepens within history. The eternal within the temporal, accomplishing God's act of reclaiming and reconciling all things to God's self. This truth, however, needs also to find a form that can direct and shape communal living, the faith community in its relationship to the world. This truth finds expression in proclamation, confessing the freedom of the gospel, but also in provisional decisions that must be continually revisited in every generation, in every new context, in every new time. This first council or synodal gathering sought both to proclaim the gospel and to care for the spiritual well-being of all that is, to discern a way forward together. What does Luther say on concilia characteristics? 
Perhaps you are already able to recognize an aspect of the Lutheran approach to synodality, always holding two things together. Faith active in love, always standing before God and before human beings. It is in this fundamental perspective that Martin Luther approaches the issue of synodality, or as he puts it, conciliarity. In the last decades of Luther's life, having given up hope that a council would be called and one in which he would actually be heard, he set about writing his magisterial reflection on the councils and the church. In this lengthy and sometimes rambling treatise, Luther defines ten characteristics of councils, or we might say ten characteristics of synodality which I will briefly summarize, focusing on the heart of his argument, rather than specifically on all ten characteristics. After analyzing the actions and decisions of the first four ecumenical councils, Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus and Halkedon, after praising and critiquing decisions made, Luther describes the main purpose or function of a council or synodal process, saying a council has no power to establish new articles of faith even though the Holy Spirit is present. Even the Apostolic Council in Jerusalem introduced nothing new in matters of faith, but rather held that which St. Peter concludes. In other words, a synodal process of decision-making does not invent anything new regarding faith, but confesses God's justifying act, the Christ event, and translates that act into understandable and relatable language. A council points to God's action in Christ. It points to and attempts to define God's act of reconciling all things, all humanity, and creation. The flip side of this insistence on keeping true to the apostolic faith and witness of the gospel is the power to suppress and to condemn new articles of faith and do so in accordance with the scriptures and the ancient faith, just as the Council of Nicaea condemned the new doctrine of Arius. Here again, the Church is called into the act of confessing in this time. It is to name and condemn all those things which individuals, communities, even nations may add to the simple and plain message of the Gospel. In recent history, such an exercise of discernment and action was taken against apartheid by the Lutheran World Federation and the World Council of Churches vis-à-vis -vis certain member churches, when a particular group, whether ethnic, class, race or gender, claims gospel fullness for itself and restricts participation in God's church based on its particular interests, such an addition to the gospel must be condemned. Luther's list of characteristics of a council develops this internal logic lifting up the ancient faith and condemning any additions that create extra requirements. Councils should confess and defend the ancient faith, Luther says, and not institute new articles of faith against the ancient faith, nor institute new good works against the old good works, but defend the old good works against the new good works nor institute new ceremonies if they are oppressive for the people, though certain ceremonies are necessary to regulate, such as maintaining certain days and places for the assembly to gather for worship and hear the preaching and receive the sacraments for praying, singing, praising and thanking God. In his conclusion to this section on the councils, Luther describes councils 
as a court of law. However, they appeal not to hum humanly devised or implemented laws, but to the one holy Christian church. And that church is created by the word. It is the church which preaches, believes, and confesses Holy Scripture. Councils or the synodal way is not afraid of charging, but it does so according to the gospel. As such, it too is a form of proclamation, for it attempts to express in communal discernment and decision-making the movement of the Holy Spirit, here and now. Though Luther appears to suggest that such a conciliar decision-making process should not create something new, it is clear that in this act of proclamation, in a time of confessing, faith will be formulated in new ways, though always faithful to tradition. For Luther, if councils are the great charges, then the pastors, teachers, parents are each in their own communities also stewards of the gospel. The concilia weighs the way of every faith community. In a rather humorous statement, Luther says that pastors take young rascals and constantly train new people to become bishops and councils. But more seriously, Luther, when he understands the task of a council to prune the large limbs from the tree that endanger its health, sees the pastor and teacher as those who plant and cultivate young trees and useful shrubs in the garden. He calls this a precious office and task, and they are the church's richest jewels, for they preserve the church. The parishes and schools, small though they are, are eternal and useful councils. The concilia, or synodal way, is first and foremost lived out on the level of the local faith community, even in every Christian home. In a Lutheran understanding, the Christian assembly has the right to judge doctrine. This possibility is, of course, rooted in the priesthood of all believers. Clearly, I cannot dive into all the dimensions of the priesthood of all believers in Luther's theology, given our time frame. But I do wish to develop the intrinsic connection between the priesthood of all believers and the Catholic understanding, as also expressed by Pope Francis, of the census fidei. The synodal way, alive in every Christian assembly, is founded on baptism. In baptism, every believer has received the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's gifts. As Luther states it in the large catechism, baptism promises and brings victory over death and the devil, forgiveness of sin, God's grace, the entire Christ and the Holy Spirit with the Spirit's gifts. These gifts of the Holy Spirit equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. As we read in Ephesians 4.12. Every Christian is called to grow in the gifts of the Spirit for the building up of the communion, the body of Christ. Every Christian is called to discern the gift of the Spirit in others, leading to unity of faith as well as growth in communion. Every Christian is equipped to walk together on this way ever deeper into communion, living out and witnessing to God's act of reconciliation. As noted at the beginning of this lecture, synodality encompasses both the spiritual and political realms. Therefore, catechesis and discernment are necessary. Discerning this way, this growth in communion, requires guidance. It requires a called ministry 
who are both stewards of word and sacraments and teachers. Education was a central agenda item of the Reformation. The faithful may be promised and given God, the entire Christ, and the Holy Spirit with all the Spirit's gifts. But that gift must be nurtured, exercised, encouraged, allowing it to grow and be active. One of the most significant gifts of the Reformation is precisely catechesis and Luther's own small and large catechism meant for the faithful and for the pastors to be studied daily. According to the Augsburg Confession, Article 14, Lutheran doctrine locates the ministry of teaching primarily in the local congregation, for which ministers are properly called and ordained to teach publicly and administer the sacraments. Linked to sound exegesis and theological reflection, the teaching office is a necessary component of church life by which individuals become responsible in the public life of the church for transmitting the gospel by which the priesthood of all believers is built up. Through education and study, through the exercise of faith in the midst of the Christian assembly, the sensus fidei is exercised in all the baptized. It was already clear to Luther that if all the baptized are called to participate in the life of the church, not only in doing good works, but engaged in discernment and decision-making, then education was essential. All are called into witness and responsibility in the life of the church, women, men, and those who identify differently. There is no distinction made in the promises of baptism. The synodal way inherently recognizes the fullness of faith of all the baptized. It seeks to continually discern and embody the communion already given by God in Jesus Christ, engaging a way of reconciliation that reaches out to all humanity and creation. A few words about mutual accountability. Already in the 16th century, Martin Luther was thus uplifting this fullness of faith found as he described it, not only in the spiritual state, but in all the baptized. In fact, one might even make the claim that the synodal way is at the heart of the Reformation, though here too the ideal is sometimes harder to put into practice than expected. The synodal church, invites all of us into a challenge. This invitation is ongoing and from the perspective of the Lutheran World Federation and in relation to the LWF's own work, synodality requires us to reflect on how we understand ourselves as a communion of churches and not just as a federation. What does being a communion imply for decision-making, for advocacy, for joint proclamation and witness? In what ways do regional and global expressions of the communion interact? How, within one communion in pulpit and altar fellowship, are we mutually accountable? I will share briefly some questions from a Lutheran perspective concerning ecclesial identity and its relation to mutual decision-making and accountability both of which define aspects of synodality. Article 4 of the LWF Constitution describes the communion in the following terms. As instrument of its autonomous member churches, the Lutheran World Federation may take action in matters committed to it by the member churches. It may act on behalf of one or more churches in such specific tasks as they commit to it. It may request individual member churches to assume tasks on behalf of the entire communion. The Constitution acknowledges the fact that member churches are autonomous 
in view of their decisions and indirectly that LWF has no jurisdiction nor does it have decision-making authority over member churches. The churches duly constituted bodies, for instance synods, assemblies, bishops' conferences, boards, make decisions on the life and witness of the church. With a shift in the LWF self-understanding, moving from a federation of churches towards a communion of churches, the relationship of LWF member churches to one another and in the global body is framed differently. New concepts emerge based on rich theological and spiritual insight, such as interdependence between churches, their mutuality, their participation in God's mission. A developing theological self-understanding, including foundational ecclesiological tenets, is a bottom-up approach in which churches need to discern and develop the instruments to be put in place in order to articulate their mutual accountability as they live and work together as a global communion of churches. Discernment on both a local and global level characterizes synodality. Such a discernment and engagement as synodal church unfolds in a time where an increased tendency towards fragmentation is more than evident and where political bodies are moving away from mutual accountability and responsibility in the life of nations and communities and also in the life of churches. As such, the Lutheran World Federation's attempt to articulate its own framework of synodality is an attempt at articulating accountability. It is a listening carefully to one another and as such can be a powerful witness to God's mission in this world that seeks to live into the oneness of the oikos, to be the church as promise and anticipation of that reality. Recent developments in the LWF show that such a framework of accountability is of critical importance, given the ongoing journey towards deepened relations of communion. Questions have come up among member churches about how to exercise their autonomy in ways that reflect their interdependence with other LWF member churches. There is increasing understanding that their own decisions, although meant to be restricted to their own jurisdiction only, do have implications on others. What are the mechanisms of decision-making that take into account interdependence? What are the basic procedures of communication and mutual acknowledgement? How do we engage cross-border cooperation and joint missionary endeavors? Given the self-understanding of the LWF as communion of churches, LWF plans to initiate a framework for mutual accountability, which would be a framework for listening to one another, listening carefully as in Acts 15. It cannot be simply a legislative text, a bylaw for communion relations, but a synodal process as churches deepen their understanding of unity as a global communion. And finally, as a conclusion, the Synodal Way is a spiritual challenge. It is discipleship not only at the heart of our ecclesial structures and theological identities, but a spiritual discipline that is at the heart of the ecumenical movement. To live ever deeper into the gift of communion also means taking responsibility for one another. It implies accepting the discipline of listening to other member churches in the communion to carry with them their struggles and burdens. The discipline is a simple one. It means not putting oneself or one's own ecclesial identity at the center, but in dialogue and in solidarity. In the LWF, the question of communion asks not only this profound spiritual question, but then also the political question 
about ecclesial structures and what forms of covenants can best take into account both the instinct of faith, the spirit-filled discernment and decisions of one member and the bound conscience of another. May I add here my gratitude to my colleagues Simone Sin from the WCC, to Bishop Matti Repo and Dirk Lange, who will continue this reflection on synodality in a Lutheran context from the juridical, pastoral and historical perspective. The Church, in its essence, is the sign of unity. It is communion that God has given in the midst of humanity that today is fragmented, exclusionary, isolationist. The Synodal Way engages the Churches together as a sign of hope in the midst of political and social tensions. The Churches can model such dialogue and hope as we are also attempting to do in the Joint Declaration on Doctrine of Justification consultation process. Let us continue to walk on this way together, in communion, bearing one another's burdens and hopes. Thank you. So we are grateful for these uh, reflections on walking together. And already now I would like to ask uh, Dr. Lange to, uh, uh, to transmit to the General Secretary the expression of our gratitude for her conference. Uh, but uh, now I would like immediately to leave uh, the word to Professor Wetter from the Gregoriana for his uh, reaction on this uh, lecture. Thank you. Um, so it's a pleasure to be a listener to Reverend Anne Burghardt. Um, I was looking forward to meeting her <laughs> in presence, but uh, it still is a pleasure to, to listen and hear this very clear and rich presentation. I will only highlight um, two and a half points. A, a half because the third one will just be a bullet point. And actually the first one will be the longest, most substantial because I find it the most important. The first point is the question of the priesthood of all believers that um, Reverend Burkhardt insisted on. Um, especially in the section on Luther, uh, the second section of her, uh, of her talk. Uh, for me, it's, it's an excellent reminder for the Roman Catholic Church uh, that synodality, synodality is grounded on this priesthood of all believers. It means that it's not only based on natural or social justice or on natural capacities, but it's an expression of the transformative efficacy of faith, of baptism, and the supernatural gifts that baptism give. This is the priesthood of all believers. Um, the consequence is finally taking seriously the fact that each believer or each baptized person has been deeply transformed, has received grace-given capacities, and has been entrusted a task for the whole church and for the world. Now, if I, if I may use the vocabulary of the tria munera, I know this is more Calvin than, than Luther, <laughs> but um, it's the way the Second Vatican Council, for example, receives this teaching. Um, I would say that synodality is the exercise of prophetic and teaching munus, um, and this is really underlined by uh, Reverend Burghardt when she speaks about Centus Fidei. I would add something that is less underlined by her, is that it's also an expression of the munus regendi, um, by which the Holy Spirit can guide, th this is an expression of the Second Vatican Council, the Holy Spirit guides ducit, um, the church through the whole people of God. It's a very strong expression. And it's also an expression, and I think this is even an invitation for the Roman Catholic Church in the synodal process, is an invitation to consider the first munus, the priestly dimension, which means that 
synodality, synodality is not only a question of discussion, of decision making, but of common prayer and of efficacious prayer for the church and for the world. That in a certain way that, that could be, uh, I wouldn't say the only, the main, well, certainly not the only, maybe not even the main, but certainly a very central aspect of what we are trying to do, what we should uh, be doing. So as my reference to the Second Vatican Council shows, the Roman Catholic Church has already been listening to the Lutheran tradition on this point. Um, it also has articulated uh, um, baptismal uh, priesthood or, uh, to ministerial priesthood in a way that is not present in Luther, um, and also sensus fidei to magisterium in a way that's not present in Luther. And I do believe that both of these aspects strengthen both um, uh, common priesthood and sensus fidei. We can eventually discuss this, but however, I do think that, first of all, we need to acknowledge that what we have received and, and be, express a deep gratitude for it. And also, listening and hearing means, this is going to sound obvious, but listening and hearing means actually changing practices. <laughs> it's so obvious. But I think that it's still work in progress in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, for example, it's probably not completely entered into general Catholic awareness that baptism does not uh, make us l lay people. <laughs> it makes us priests. And all these priests will either exercise this priesthood as lay people or as religious or by receiving ordination in ministerial priesthood. Um, other, another aspect that, should, that is not completely entered into Catholic awareness is that um, universal priesthood is directly and immediately related to Christ and not bound to ministerial priesthood. What I mean by this is um, I do believe, I have to say this, that in the general Catholic awareness, um, when the believers, all the believers participate in church life, it's partly a delegation from ministerial priests or while it w theologically speaking we need to really integrate the fact that uh, a baptized faithful who's praying for others who, who's proclaiming faith um, who is leading others is not doing so in dependency of the ministers but directly in relation to christ and through a gift that is given to him or her directly um, there would be a lot to say also about uh, understanding the relationship between ministerial priesthood and universal priesthood. I'll just say one aspect is um, we also need to completely receive the fact that uh, ministerial priesthood exists only for the sake of baptismal priesthood and is at the service not only of the baptized, but of, of baptismal priesthood itself, which is not the same thing. Being at the service of the baptized can almost be um, paternalistic. It can become paternalistic. Being at the service of priesthood, of the priesthood of all, means furthering and developing this priesthood and letting the space for this priesthood. So this would be the first aspect where, and the most important. Ju a second point um, is Reverend Burkhardt insists a lot on the spiritual dimension of synodality. She speaks a few times about um, a challenge for spiritual life. She speaks a few times of spiritual discipline, discipline, discipline. And I think this is very illuminating in the sense that before being a question for church structure and institution, synodality is a question of spiritual life in the strongest meaning of the word. Um, it means that synodality implies a personal conversion of each believer and implies a conversion of the church, of the insti institution of the church, and will bring about this conversion. It means it's grounded on conversion. Um, in the same, because it's based on priesthood of the faithful and priesthood is a gift of grace, it, it means conversion. And so you, you have different levels. You have the necessity of a conversion to listen to Christ's voice, 
to listen to the Holy Spirit, to be attuned to the Holy Spirit. You need conversion also to exercise charity to the other, towards the others. That's part of synodality, is receiving the other in his or her difference and being able to exercise real charity in this case. Um, and so I, I'd say I have a, here, a, in a way, a question about this point is how can we, how can the Roman Catholic Church accompany its reflection and its practice uh, on this, on synodality with, uh, by giving the structure, the conditions for this conversion? Uh, how can it integrate this dimension in the synodal practice? The third point, which I will only say as a bullet point because my time's up, <laughs> is um, I was struck also by, um, especially at the end of uh, Reverend Burghardt's paper, the insistence on communion and unity. Uh, now, of course, maybe this is a Catholic way of receiving what she said because unity and communion is, is so important in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, but what struck me is, yes, um, unity is the criterion for authentic synodality. It's it, to discern the fruit of synodality. But I think often in Many, aspect, many parts of the Roman Catholic Church would have the impression that synodality can bring confusion and disorder and that unity will be brought in, by, in balance by this church structure. Well, here, listening to Reverend Burkhart, I was thinking, obvious, <laughs> but I was thinking, actually, we are here in a situation in which synodality um, furthers unity. The expression of the voice of each faithful is not something that needs to be balanced by the structure, but will and should further the unity. So this is a modest, because only two and a half points, <laughs> there would be many others, a contribution to the way I think that um, I, as a Roman Catholic theologian, think that I, we can, the, Ro the, church, the Roman Catholic Church can listen and hear and learn from the Lutheran tradition, and especially from this paper. Thank you very much. So thank you also for this rigorous respect of, uh, of our timetable. Um, for this reason, we now have really space for, I do not know, two or three uh, questions or remarks from your side. Please. Uh, yes, there's a microphone. It's Paul Avis, and uh, I'm deeply appreciative of Anna Burkhart's presentation and also of uh, Professor Etienne's um, uh, commentary on it. Deeply appreciative. I would just like to offer a brief gloss on the expression, the priesthood of all believers. Now, my dear Lutheran colleagues, not very far away, may wish to challenge this, but my understanding is that that is, an, I know obviously it's a translation into English from Latin and possibly German as well. I don't believe that expression as such is found in Luther's writings. I don't believe it's found in the uh, Reformation uh, Lutheran confessions either. However, there's something very close to it, which is the general or common uh, uh, priesthood. And I think you use those I expressions. And uh, personally, I prefer to speak about the... Uh, royal prophetic priesthood of all the baptized, and that relates to the tria munera. And um, priesthood of all believers is, is a, a phrase and a bit of a slogan, quite frankly, in some Protestant circles, and may prove to be a little bit of a stumbling block to reconciliation between our different traditions. So there are other ways of talking about this which perhaps don't raise uh, so many uh, questions, and uh, they're more uh, biblical, in terms of uh, 1 Peter, chapter 2, and also, I think, uh, uh, provide more common ground between our traditions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we can take one further question, because afterwards I would like to give um, to Dr. Lange time to 
to make the part of uh, Reverend Burkhardt, no? So uh, we can still hear uh, this observation, please. Yes, thank you, yes, I, I also enjoy very much the talk of the Dr. Ann. I, I just was a little bit confused about one thing that she said. Uh, we've been speaking about the goal of the central process is the common good, the good of the church. And if I understood what she said, at one point she was uh, specifying the different principles of uh, councils that uh, the ten that Lutheran had given, and, and one that she mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, is she said to defend the old works and to suppress uh, the new works. Uh, and I was confused by that. I mean, if some if a work is good, why, what difference does it make whether it's old or new? Isn't it uh, to be encouraged? So I, I was confused by that. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So we give to you the word for for a reaction, please. Reverend Lange. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Avis. Uh, you highlight actually a point that I will be making in my intervention in the second half, uh, and which uh, Professor Vetu uh, has also lifted up uh, actually in Luther, um, and recent scholarship has gone over this. Uh, uh, the term priesthood of all believers is really not uh, his expression. It's the universal or common uh, common priesthood and defined exactly as uh, you defined it, uh, as uh, the believer, the baptized, having access to Christ, uh, or having access to God with the only mediator being uh, Christ, uh, so that there is not the necessity technically of a priestly uh, orders or in, in, that, uh, in that sense. So, um, uh, there is a necessity, of course, but that comes in through another angle, uh, the universal priesthood then being that access to God uh, through Christ as the only mediator. Um, as to old works and, and new works, um, uh, or uh, these are very typical passages, I would say, rhetorically by Luther that uh, are, can be confusing, uh, so uh, you're totally justified in that. Uh, uh, in that. Um, what Luther is saying with, the, with uh, new works in terms of works that add something to the proclamation, that add conditions to the proclamation of the gospel, um, so there, are, uh, the, there is the apostolic tradition, uh, the justification by faith, that is the core, uh, the, the core proclamation that uh, founds the church, that must be defended, so to speak, and anything that gets added to that, any other requirements are to be suppressed. So that's always the, the dynamic there in Luther's writing, uh, that concern of having, if you will, gospel plus added things that are not truly necessary for the gospel to be effective. The, um, uh, yeah, I think that, uh, that probably is the best, uh, best way to, to explain that. Thank you very much. So we can conclude this part of the session. Thank you very much. And we pass now to the panel. Thank you very much. I think it's, it has been a, a moment in which we, we listen a lot. And there is a lot of things that we need to process. But in the meantime, we continue to, to, to listen to the Lutheran uh, approach, and I invite uh, M Michael Jonas, Professor D. Lange, Dr. Simon Sin, and Bishop Martin Repo to be with us. I'm very pleased to introduce you. Uh, 
Reverend Michael Jonas. Is, he is the pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran community in Rome. I am really happy to say that in this Institute for Ecumenical Studies, all our students have been really delighted to go to the community, to the, to the church, to the Lutheran church in Rome, and find them not only an experience of being received, but also a moment to learn and to pray together. Uh, and we are really happy to have you here with us. You are our uh, moderator, so please, the floor is for you. Thank you so much for this introduction. I will introduce very shortly our three relators for this panel and then pass to their conferences, their papers. I will present them in the order of their papers. So the first is Reverend Professor Dr. Dirk Lang. He's the actual Assistant General Secretary for Ecumenical Relations of the Lutheran World Federation. In general, and actually he is teaching worship and Christian mission as a professor at the Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. Professor Lang was the, the, North, uh, the North American Lutheran representative on the fifth phase of the International Joint Lutheran Catholic Dialogue Commission. He's the primary author of the Common Prayer for the Joint Catholic Lutheran Commemoration of the 500 Years of Reformation and was the project officer for his commemorative, commemorative uh, liturgy celebrated on October 31st, 2016 with Pope Francis and leaders of the Lutheran World Federation. Reverend Dr. Simone Sin served as a study secretary for public theology and interreligious relations at the Lutheran World Federation. Now she is serving as academic dean at the Bosse Ecumenical Institute of the Ecumenical Church Council. And I'm happy to see her again today because we were studying together in at Tübingen University some years ago and we were Actually, we were reading together um, Luther's writing of uh, councils and churches, uh, what uh, Anne Burkhardt was uh, referring to. Reverend Dr. Matti Repo is Bishop of the Diocese of Tampere in Finland. Since 2007, he has been an Associate Professor of Dogmatics at the University of Helsinki Faculty of Theology. Bishop Repo has served as an advisor to the Lutheran World Federation Council and as a member in the Commission for Churches in Dialogue of the Conference of European Churches. He's presently a vice chair to the Finnish Ecumenical Council, Lutheran co-chair of the Porvo Contact Group and a part of the Board of Trustees in the Institute for Ecumenical Research in Strasbourg. So I give the word to Professor Dirk Lang. Thank you, and uh, thank you to uh, the organizers, to uh, Professor uh, Hyacinth and Juan, and, uh, and for this wonderful welcome here at the Angelicum. Uh, one can never warn uh, enough against the tendency uh, to romanticize uh, this warning encompasses a Reformation and particularly a Lutheran focus on the notion of synodality based on what we were just talking about, the priesthood of all believers. As General Secretary Anna Burkhardt has pointed out, synodality has perhaps never been truly absent from our understanding of church, but it has not always been as determinative as it could be. There is often a great distance between a theological ideal and a political social reality. Luther himself was what we might call uh, ambivalent or had an ambivalent relationship with the conciliar uh, process based on his historical assessment of, of the councils. It is well noted that on the one hand, he continually maintained hope that the Pope would call for a council uh, to listen, to dialogue, to consider the proposals of the reformers, uh, a hope that's expressed in his address to the Christian nobility, um, but in many other writings. 
He hoped for a council that would discern the movement of the Holy Spirit. At the same time, he was very leery, even suspicious about councils, noting in his address at the Diet of Worms in 1521 that he does not trust popes and councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves. I am bound, he said, by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the words of God. We might underline bound by the word of God, not by a council or broader decision-making process. It is, of course, difficult to summarize the history of synodality from a Lutheran perspective, since there are so many variations based on so many different context, contexts even within Europe itself, let alone in the global experience of Lutheranism. I will focus on a couple of examples, uh, primarily reflecting on the Lutheran presence in my home context, that of North America. The picture that emerges is rather sobering, uh, I must say, for a Lutheran, and yet it indicates the challenge and necessity of this synodal process. A particular historical controversy highlights for us the complexity of implementation when in the early decades of the 16th century, the, the reformers had to def devise new methods of governance since local bishops were refusing to support the evangelical witness. When Episcopal authority is lacking, what replaces it? In 1536, a conflict was brewing in the city, German city of Zwickau between the city council and the parish pastor. The city council claiming its responsibility and understanding itself in some ways as delegated, if not called, was appointing persons to minister in the church and in the schools without consultation with the parish pastor, or in perhaps the German nomenclature of today, uh, the superintendent. The parish pastor of the city, a certain Leonard Bayer objected. He claimed the right to choose assisting ministers and deacons for other parishes, sending them to Wittenberg, ordaining and anointing them. The council did not agree and restated its position. The city council reserved the right to elect or appoint these persons. The parish pastor, they argued, was simply trying to exer exercise his former authority of lordship, that is, the authority of papal clerics, over the city council. The city council insisted that it would appoint persons and that then and only then the parish pastor could send them to Wittenberg. The parish pastor relinquished his position but continued to complain about it from the pulpit. Uh, as tensions continued uh, to grow, the parish pastor finally went himself to Wittenberg to get the opinion of Martin Luther. A letter communicating Wittenberg's, uh, Wittenberg's formal opinion to the city council of Zwickau was sent on Monday after the day of St. Mary Magdalene in the year 1536. The letter was signed by Martin Luther, Johannes Bugenhagen, parish pastor of Wittenberg, and Georg Spalatin, advisor to the elector. In this letter, the signatories clearly state, I quote, from the beginning, these two offices were separated by Christ, and experience all too often shows that there can be no peace where the town council or the city wants to rule the parish, or vice versa, where the parish rector, pastor, wants to rule the government, government or the city as the example of the papacy has showed us all too well. Thus, if the city council should intentionally accept or sanction an assistant preacher, a schoolmaster, or church worker without the parish pastor's knowledge or consent, you, the parish pastor, should not concede or grant that precedent. Governance by uh, ordained ministry was to be upheld in matters of church life and discipline. In fact, even consultation was not considered a particular necessity. Only Philip Melanchthon offered a contrarian opinion. 
quoting, it appears to be right, just, and useful. He wrote that this calling of assisting deacons and of those who teach in the schools should be jointly in possession of the council and the pastor of the church. End of quote. The point, I believe, is clear. The Reformation did not immediately herald a new form of governance grounded in a theology of the priesthood of all believers, nor did it establish a synodal process. The historical development is far more complex and contradictory. I will begin considering the role of this universal priesthood in the ministry of church, provide some contrarian examples, and then return to the potential and challenge um, of synodality today. An understanding of the ministry of all the baptized and their participation in the discernment processes of church authorities is embedded, yes, in the theology of Martin Luther. Luther deconstructs, as you know, the divide between all the baptized and those ordained to priestly ministry, as we've just been discussing. There is one ministry to which all the baptized are called, though that doesn't make them all pastors. The whole church is a priesthood, out of which some are called to, to public and ordained uh, ministry. However, the enactment or practice of Luther's theology has remained an ongoing challenge. Already in Luther's own writing, the notion of universal priesthood is found, uh, whereas, as scholarly research has shown, the priesthood of all believers is absent, or mostly or primarily absent. And then even in Luther's own writings, other than the work on the councils and the church, the universal priesthood does not figure significantly. The universal priesthood is also not a confessional emphasis in the Lutheran confessional writings, the Book of Concord. The notion appears primarily in Melanchthon's treatise and primacy of the Pope, where the true church is defined alone as alone possessing the priesthood and the right of electing and ordaining ministers, end of quote. Contrary to more popular belief or perhaps even some stereotypes, Lutherans were far more occupied and had a lot more to say about ordained ministry than they ever did about the universal priesthood. Perhaps a heavier emphasis on the universal priesthood was shaped more by other streams, or the priesthood of all believers was shaped more by other streams of Protestantism, uh, both orthodox and pietistic, and emerging rationalism. There is yet another side to this complex picture. It has been argued that as, early, as the early church grew in its own self-understanding, it also began to uh, adopt a more hierarchical structure, as Professor Avis also uh, discussed in his intervention this morning in the medieval church. Luther's opposition to a hierarchical structure was not an opposition to hierarchy per se, but when that hierarchy imposes conditions and new requirements and obligations upon the baptized, it must be resisted. The misuse of power is reason for reform. However, and this however indicates the complexity of the issue, the reform of church structure that stemmed from Luther's proposals did not make appeal to all the baptized or to the priesthood of all believers, but in fact appealed to civic authority for both secular and organizational assistance. Uh, much as we saw from the Anglican example and uh, uh, as Will Adam had presented it this morning. Since the ecclesial structure of the time failed the reform, the reformers turned to the princes. The reform separated the secular or civic authority from the ecclesial authority of the medieval bishop and relied upon that civic authority. A Lutheran uh, 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 theologian, uh, Haman, has shown that a principle of synodality 
based on participation of the faithful in church orders is in fact quite a rare practice. The involvement of non-ordained persons in church history began primarily in the 19th century and even then only sporadically. The situation is exemplified in the newly founded churches in Lutheran churches in North America. Henry Melchior Muhlenberg, educated and ordained in Halle, Germany, arrived in Philadelphia in the new colonies in 1742. He was surprised and troubled by the freedom he discovered in this new context, so different from the German context in which he had been raised. In this new context, according to his account, he found the people unruly, uh, literally uh, without a prince or without a system really of government. There was little respect, especially for such things as ordained ministry and sacraments. He complained quite often about being mocked and ignored and rejected. In this new context of radical freedom, one of his first concerns was to establish a well-educated and properly vetted ordained clergy who could offer guidance to the people. Eventually, he and a few others began training and ordaining such persons in North America. To that end, Muhlenberg helped to establish what became known as the Ministerium of Pennsylvania in 1748. It is noteworthy that this newly formed oversight group was not called a synod, but a ministerium consisting of ordained persons only. There are, of course, many social, political, economic, and even, as in North America, geographic reasons for this lack of attention to synodical process within church government, historically speaking. Theology, however, is not one of those uh, causes or reasons. Though the importance attached to ordained ministry can be quite prominently attested, at the same time, it was coupled with a keen awareness of the necessity of an educated laity. This concern is witnessed in many of the church orders that sprung up in German cities in the early decades of the Reformation, as well as in subsequent church orders developed by Lutheran churches around the globe. A brief sampling of these church orders reveals that almost each one begins the same way, with instructions for the organizations of schools within a parish. In these instructions, the schoolmaster was almost as important as the pastor. The education of children was paramount, as was catechism for all members. How else could the father and the mother of a household be bishop and bishopess, as Luther designated her, for the family. The early church orders also highlight the reform of the liturgy as it plays a critical role in the formation of people into what I will call a gospel community. As noted earlier, it is a curious fact that in the history of Western expression of Lutheranism, there was such a heavy emphasis on the role of the ordained pastor to the neglect of the ministry of all the baptized. It is curious because Luther had a radical theology of the universal priesthood, one in which all the baptized have access to God without any mediator other than Jesus Christ. Everything was already given in baptism. An early treatise by Luther is enlightening in this regard. It is called Concerning Ministry from 1523. It defines this universal priesthood, suggesting that all, uh, all possess the power of the keys. As we have already, uh, uh, quote, as we have declared already, the ministry of the word belongs to all. Whether they, the Church of Luther's Day, want to or not, they must concede that the keys are an exercise of the ministry of the word and belong to all Christians, end of quote. In this uh, treatise, Luther discusses the marks of the church, 
preaching, baptism, holy communion, the office of the keys, ministry, prayer, and thanksgiving, and the responsibility that each person has with regards to these marks. However, in his concluding reflections on each mark, Luther places also a warning. Yes, these marks define Christian ministry, not just priestly ministry, but for the good of order, someone is designated in the community to steward these marks. The treatise concerning uh, ministry makes another proposal which is particularly interesting for our discussion, and especially so that it too was not fully developed in subsequent Lutheranism, nor for that matter by Luther himself. Outlining the first six marks of the church, Luther then names the seventh and final last function uh, of the church is to judge and pass on doctrines. The Christian community or local church is recognized by its synodal structure, not by a hierarchy or by an imposed order. Yes, there is order, but it is mutually discerned. Yes, there is societal structure with political dimensions within the church, but it is mutually exercised. The Christian assembly, immersed in God's word and at one at the Eucharistic table, nurtures lively conversation, debate, dialogue, and discernment on the character of proclamation in any given context. In conclusion, potential and challenge. After this rather cursory and contextually limited historical overview, I will uh, be rather blunt in my assessment. Uh, Lutherans need to take more seriously their own theology and its ecclesiological implications. The synodal process uh, for the Roman Catholic Church that uh, Pope Francis has lost, dr uh, launched draws attention for Lutherans to this challenge uh, and is recognized with gratitude. Of course, in recent decades, there have been significant advances, uh, which my colleagues will talk about. In North America today, one of the largest members of the Lutheran World Federation, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, requires 60% lay participation in regional synods and in national uh, uh, church-wide decision-making processes. In the LWF itself, quotas are set for lay participation uh, and for an equal participation of women and men in the decision-making process. The increased and increasing role of women highlights as well an ever-broadening concept of vocation within the universal priesthood. The ordination of women within uh, the LWF has been an important step in dismantling a particular culturally construed, uh, constructed hierarchy. Yet few current Lutheran resources exist that reflect on the synodal challenge and potential. More has been uh, written, including an ecumenical dialogue on Episcopal ministry. Yet uh, some 40 years ago, the LWF produced an important study document, The Ministry of All Baptized Believers. This study lifted up several core principles on ministry. All members of the people of God participate in God's action or mission of reclaiming the world to God's self, reconciling all things through Christ. The baptized participant in this ministry, participate in this ministry according to the gifts they have received in community for the building up of community. And just over 20 years ago, the signing of the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification between the LWF and the Roman Catholic Church and to which our Methodist, Anglican, and Reformed colleagues present here have now associated, forming the JDDJ Consultation Group. The JDDJ process represented for the LWF a significant synodal engagement. In fact, the Lutheran World Federation cons consulted all member churches and their synods for input, feedback, consent. JDDJ on the side of the LWF represented a synodal process. The JDDJ embodies, as uh, Professor Legrand uh, uh, writes, a paradigm shift 
one which, through its methodology of differentiating consensus, opens the possibility of listening more, broad, listening more broadly, beyond the particular ways of historical patterns and modes of thinking. Um, I would add that differentiating consensus not only makes possible significant ecumenical advances, it can also be applied to internal e ecclesial discernment, especially when mutually opposed theological conceptions on such things as ministry or ecclesiology appear to block the ability to listen, even to others in one's own uh, tradition. The synodal way to conclude, as uh, Anna Burkhardt noted, encompasses both the spiritual and political realms. This reality is always threatening to the existing order in any of our ecclesial structures, and yet it is the challenge addressed by proclamation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dirk Lang, for your interesting view or approach in historical, in historical view of uh, the synodality. Now we directly go on to the juridical perspective, and I give the word to Dr. Simone Sin. So, thank you very much uh, to the organizing committee for inviting me um, to this really interesting and important uh, conference. My presentation consists of three parts. Um, first of all, I will again give uh, attention to theology. This is how we Lutherans enter any discussion, even when we talk about the juridical perspective. Um, and then secondly, I will focus on the legal regulations that govern procedures of synods in different Lutheran churches. In the final section, I will then offer three points for further reflection for all of us together. Almost exactly 500 years ago, on January 29th, 1523, Martin Luther started to write a treatise that deals with the question whether people in the congregation would have a role in governance. The text in German has a quite long title, and it actually contains the main assertion that Luther puts forward. The title in English is the right and power of a Christian congregation or community to judge all teaching and to call, appoint, and dismiss teachers established and proved from scripture. So Luther's main arguments for the right of the congregation to take leadership decisions are relevant for our conversation on synodality. Right in the first paragraph, Luther makes it very clear that it is important to know where and what a Christian congregation is. And if that is not clarified, decision-making processes would be misunderstood as a purely human affair. Luther underlines that what makes a Christian congregation is the preaching of the gospel. The first scripture reference in this treatise is Isaiah 55, 10. My word that goes forth out of my mouth shall not return unto me void, but as the rain comes down from heaven and waters the earth, so shall my word accomplish all things whereto I send it. So for Luther, this promise of God is the foundation for the assertion that where the word is preached, there God will fulfill its purpose. And then the next scripture reference is John 10:27. My sheep hear my voice. So Luther says, I quote, bishops, pope, theologians, and anyone else have the power to teach. But the sheep are to judge whether what they teach is the voice of Christ or the voice of strangers. End of quote. We find this very same image of the sheep listening to the voice of Christ in the small cult articles in a brief description, very famous, of what the, church, what the church is. It says, thank God a child seven years old knows what the church is, namely the holy believers and sheep who hear the voice 
of their shepherd. So for the church, the voice of the shepherd and hearing of the believers are the two constituents. Article 7 of the Augsburg Confession stipulates, we know it, the church is the congregation of saints in which the gospel is purely taught and the sacraments are rightly, rightly administered. So I make this <laughs> prolegomena simply to say that the key purpose of any structure of the church is to provide the means and the space to do precisely this, communicate the gospel. The ministry serve the pur serves the purpose of communicating the gospel and is a divine institution. The church structures and church law, however, are not divine institution according to the Lutheran perspective. They are human-made regulations. So the criterion for the adequateness of any of ch the church regulations is whether the purpose and the mission of the church is fulfilled. From the understanding of church law as human-made regulations follows that its inherent historicity is acknowledged. So this means that also a certain diversity in these regulations across time and space is not only accidental, but actually to be expected. I will not go, I have one paragraph also on the universal priesthood, I don't need to go into that. Um, and it's clear that it changed the understanding um, of the ordained ministry, first of all, because it's not a special capacity um, given to certain people, but it's a mandate given to certain people, and, and that's a different understanding. So church governance, Luther says it clearly, is a matter of the whole church and not just the ordained. Now I come to the second part, the legal setup of synods in Lutheran churches. I will start uh, with my own context, Germany, and then go to um, some other countries. I have been recently in touch with colleagues from Lutheran churches in Zimbabwe, India, Sweden, Brazil, Poland, Canada, and Indonesia to ask them specific questions about the legal constitutional setup. So let me start with Germany. If we look at the church governance in Lutheran churches in Germany from the 16th century until today, we see significant change in the concrete ordering of governance. In the Lutheran churches in the 16th century, um, it was mainly the civil authorities, the civil rulers, the prince, the duke, so-called Landeskirchliches Kirchenregiment that ruled, governed the church. And the administration of the church governance was exercised by a consistory, an office in which both theologians and jurists uh, collaborated. So more participatory structures were then envisaged in the 19th century. But the major shift took place after 1918, when the constitutional monarchy in Germany ended. So the close ties between church and state authorities were dissolved and the church structures almost had to be reinvented. Let me now more specifically go to my own church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Württemberg, just as one example. We introduced the first parish councils in 1851, so in the middle of the 19th century. In 1854, diocesan councils were established and the members of the diocesan councils were delegated by the parish councils. And then a first synod on the church-wide level was established in 1869. It had only consultative status. At the time, there were 50 members, 25 ordained and 25 non-ordained. At the time, only men could vote, only men could be elected. In 1920, then, the new constitution was established, and with this constitution, the Synod acquired full autonomy from state structures. Since then, the members of the Synod have been elected through direct elections by the church members, now both women and men. It needs to be mentioned uh, that this kind of direct election in my church is an exception in the German context. Uh, in most other Lutheran churches, the election to the Synod proceeds from the parish councils not from the church members directly. 
And globally, we see that both ways of electing the church-wide synod is possible, either direct, uh, also the Church of Sweden, for example, but um, most of the churches, it seems to me, actually have the delegated election starting from the parish councils. Now, some general remarks on the different levels of church governance. Many churches have basically three levels, but in large churches it could be more, but let's speak about basically three levels of church structures. The local congregation or parish, as I mentioned before, the governance body would be the parish council. Then we have a mid-level uh, body, um, sometimes called regional synod or diocesan synod, um, and then we have the church-wide synod or church-wide assembly. Now, with regard to the question as to who is eligible as a member of the synod, the answer is usually all members of the church of a certain age. Some churches specify and say all communicate communicant members of the church. Today, the age is mostly 18 years old, but in Sweden it's 16 years. In my own church, actually, it has been lowered the right to vote to 14 years. The right to be elected is still at 18 years. So, yeah, there's a certain diversity, but it's clearly stipulated in the regulations. Now, with regard to the size of the synod, the number of the members varies greatly. So the number depends, of course, on the size of the church, but also on the role that the synod has. In my church, the synod is convened three times a year, but in other churches, the synod could be convened only once every two years because they do have another smaller body that would govern the church in between these meetings. So for example, this is the case in Indonesia or in Brazil. In most of the synods, there would always be ordained people, but the non-ordained would be in the majority. In some churches, the ratio between ordained and non-ordained is regulated. For example, two-third non-ordained, one-third ordained. But in a number of churches, it's also not a fixed ratio. A few churches have regulations with regard to the number of youth and or women. For example, the Jaipur Evangelical Lutheran Church in India has, has fi fixed ratios for these groups. Now, a number of synods have the possibility to elect some more people to the synod, and they could be elected either as members or advisors to the synod. In many synods, there are not only elected members, but also a certain number of ex officio members for example, from theological institutions, from certain ministries within the church, diaconal ministries, women's ministry, and so on. In Lutheran churches today, the synod plays a key role in church governance. But it is usually not the only organ of church governance. In order to give an overview of the matter that are part of the decision-making of the synod, I will give the example of the Lutheran Church in Poland, um, and I will quote from a short summary paragraph. The Synod is the supreme authority of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in the Republic of Poland. It's epitome and the expression of all rights vested in the Church. It is appointed to enact Church laws, its jurisdiction includes, among other things, the election of the church's bishop, ensuring the preservation of the purity of the doctrine of the church, upholding the rights, welfare, and unity of the church, the election of the consistory and the synodal council, which constitutes the presidium of the synod and represents it between sessions. End of quote. So this is an example, but now let me more generally say what are uh, the mandates that usually a synod would have in, in Lutheran churches. So the synod elects the bishop and sometimes also other senior leadership positions. The synod decides on legal matters and policy matters. The synod decides on financial matters, which means it discusses and approves the budget of the church. 
and the Synod can issue public statements on ecclesial as well as societal issues. Often, the Synod also takes decision on liturgical, theological, and ethical matters. A good number of churches, however, have procedures through which this is not decided by the Synod alone, but in cooperation with a theological commission, a bishop's conference, or another leadership body. In some churches, the bishop has the right to, vote ag to veto ag against certain matters that the synod has decided. This is, ex for example, the case in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Bavaria. Often the bishop reports to the synod and has to give accountability reports. But at the same time with these accountability reports, the bishop, through his or her opening address, can also take this as an opportunity to, to set an agenda um, uh, in, for the synod. So the bishop often is a member of the synod. Only in some churches he or she is not because there is a kind of um, complementary role between synod and bishop. In some churches, the synod president is a layperson, but again, there is no general rule. So you hear me saying in some churches, in most churches, this is just part of the diversity as we look into the different regulations. One thing is important. In the Lutheran understanding of synod, decision making and decision taking cannot be separated. The synod can not only advise the bishop or the church leadership, but is church leadership. If this principle would be violated, this would betray the universal priesthood. What is important is the fact that most churches have often three, we also saw it in the example from Poland, three different organs, synod, church council, or however it's called, and bishop. And the church law, the constitution provides clear regulations as to how these different organs of church governance um, interact with one another, what their specific rights and duties are. Now I come to my final part, uh, and I want to offer three points for reflection. My first point seems obvious, but I want to underline it. Synod meetings are not, first of all, business meetings in a narrow sense, but the synod is the people of God gathered in worship, prayer, discernment, and decision. So worship services, prayers, and in my church also extensive Bible studies are foundational elements for the synod. Almost 30 years ago, Wolfgang Huber has published an article on synodality and conciliarity in which he explains the spirituality and ethos of conciliarity. And he says that the communion experienced in worship and the Lord's Supper is the original conciliarity. The church lives from the trust in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And as I said in the beginning, listening to the voice of Christ is at the center. And all participate in that. So the synodal structure is not only an internal organizational regulation, but it is the church and it becomes part of the witness of the church to the wider society. So in our best moments as church, the ethos of conciliarity and structures of synodality become a witness to the wider society. Of course, we Lutherans know synods can fail and there are examples of when they have failed, that not, notwithstanding that. I come to my second point. Lutheran synods generally take decisions through voting. The rules and regulations clearly stipulate which matters will be decided by simple majority and which would need, for example, two-third majority. However, the kind of debates that is aimed for is not the struggle between different parties, as we heard before, between the ruling, and the, the ruling party and the opposition. No, it is common discernment. And in some synods, there are still, not least my own, um, the synod members are organized in groupings, in nomination groups, um, and they represent different um, senses of, of uh, theological emphasis and piety. 
it is interesting to note that the distinction is not between lay and ordained, because we find lay and ordained in all these different groupings. So that, that there's, I would say, no major tension between lay and ordained generally, but rather between different piety and, and theological emphasis. Still, the spirit of the synod should be cordial, not adversarial. And even though there is no formal consensus procedure, um, the spirit should come close to that. I mean, let us remember that even in the beginning of the Confessio Augustana, the big word Magnus Consensus has been mentioned. So there is in the Lutheran mind, so to say, um, a sense or sensibility um, for this understanding of a Magnus Consensus guided by the Holy Spirit. My final point um, goes to the global level. We have heard already um, uh, quite a bit about the Lutheran World Federation, and uh, Lutheran churches around the world are often both members of the LWF as well as the WCC, and this is an interesting experience for Lutheran churches. The LWF uses majority vote, voting in its procedures, while the WCC introduced consensus procedures about 20 years ago. And the experience of the consensus procedure has an important impact on the global ecumenical fellowship. It spreads the ethos of conciliarity. And I would say Lutheran churches have learned from that a lot. But at the same time, I would argue, because I've worked for both the LWF and the WCC, that the LWF with its majority voting procedures has no less contributed to the ethos of conciliarity because the ethos of conciliarity does not depend on which kind of regulations and procedures exactly, but it depends on the kind of ethos that de facto um, uh, gu guides and governs the interaction with, um, within the governing bodies. I would like to stop at this point. I thank you for your attention. Simone, we thank you for this enlightening perspective of the juridical um, acting in um, synodal, uh, synodal ways and decisions, synodality. And now let's pass to Bishop Repo and the pastoral reflections on synodality in Lutheran churches. Thank you very much. Uh, distinguished participants of this, this uh, symposium, I'm very much thankful and honored me too, for this opportunity to take part in this, this, uh, this meeting. And I, I'm, I'm very thankful to Professor Juan Usma, whom I got to know some 15 years ago in a consultation on the theology of confirmation, and I'm happy that he, he has remembered me. <laughs> <laughs> now, synod, as we all know, is a Greek word denoting those walking together the same way. And in the New Testament, it is used a couple of times, a couple of times of a company of travelers, but when taking a synodal approach to the church, we are not only talking about journeying together from one place to another, more than that, we are following the same calling, striving for common ideals, living together and sharing a common goal, aiming our life to the kingdom of God. According to the book of Acts, one of the phrases the early Christians used to describe themselves was those walking the way, the Greek hodos. Some modern translations seek to clarify in those few passages it by amending it to the way of the Lord or the way of God, as it is occurring in a couple of verses. The way seems to be a particularly Lucan expression in the New Testament. The whole gospel story, according to Luke, appears as a way of Jesus from Bethlehem to Egypt and back to Nazareth, and later from Galilee to Jerusalem and further to Heavenly Father. Christianity means following Jesus on his way. A synodal approach to the church opens a wide perspective to what it means to be a Christian in general. The concept of synod is often limited to describe church governance. But when understood as walking together the way of Christ, 
being a member in the living body of Christ and called into witness and service in the name of Christ, it turn out, turns out to be a fundamental ecclesiological concept. In the following, I attempt to give some pastoral reflections on the synodal approach from two perspectives. First, on participating in the decision-making of the church. And second, on the wider belonging to the same body and sharing in the mission of the Church of Christ. Although I am trying to distinguish between them, they nevertheless are closely related to each other and, and, and bound together with each other. Some churches in the tradition of the Reformation describe themselves as episcopally led and democratically governed. This is the ideal of at least certain Lutheran and Anglican churches, although they don't always use the same phrases. It must be noted that not all Lutheran churches do have bishops, altogether they do have, although they do have ministries exercising oversight. And not all Lutheran churches emphasize the historical continuity of laying on of hands in the consecration of a bishop, as it is done today in the Nordic Lutheran churches, subscribing to the Borvo Declaration together with the Anglican churches of Britain and Ireland. At the same time, Lutheran churches do also differ in how their members are made partakers of church governance and how the laity in general are involved in leadership together with the ordained clergy. A combination of their responsibility is nevertheless a necessity in all Lutheran churches. In the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Finland, it is an overall policy to include the lay as well as ordained members together in decision-making on all levels. The two dimensions, we might call them Episcopal and the Synodal, they are side by side responsible for church governance from parish level through diocesan level up to national synod level, as we already heard earlier today be the case in the Anglican churches too. On the local level, the parish board is selected by church members by voting in a public election. The board decides on the finances of the congregation, including the percentage of church tax. In Finland, the parishes finance themselves and pay their share in the church tax, in their, in their, pay their share from the church tax to the central fund of the church. And the dioceses, on their part, only get their finances from the church central fund by a decision in the general synod. So the diocese does not decide on how many clergy or other personnel a local parish should have or whether they should build an assembly hall or sell their parsonage. Their money does not flow from above, from the diocese, but from below, from their members. And we in the diocese are dependent on, on that through the central fund decided upon by the General Synod. So this is different from, from, from some, some churches with, with Episcopal or, or order. In that sense, the local parish boards can be considered more powerful than the diocesan level. The parish board is chaired by a lay person. No employees of that parish can be members in the board. Full members, I mean. However, those employed by some other parish are eligible to become members of, of the board of the parish they belong to. In many local boards, there are clergy of the neighboring parish or even the retired vicar of the very same parish as a full member. In most cases, these people can assist the incumbent priest and become, so to say, wonderful counselors for the benefit of all. But one might suggest the laity be given more seats. But this is what happens when there is a public election. The board appoints the parish council, which decides on the activities of the congregation and prepares all the items for the board. And it is the priest in charge who is ex officio the chair of the parish council. And a lay person steps in as a vice chair. 
Together, the priest and the council are in the leadership of the spiritual activities in the parish. But in the end, it's only the priest who is responsible for it. In a diocese, the bishop chairs the chapter. Now, this is hard to, this is hard to translate from Finnish, but it's simply Dom Capital in Swedish and maybe in German too. Sometimes in the history it was called consistory. Anyway, the bishop is the chair of a chapter of seven members, including two lay delegates representing the parishes. So the majority are, are ordained clergy in the, in the uh, chapter. There is also a diocesan synod in each of our dioceses, but in practice it has not much to decide on. It kind of falls between the strong parish councils and parish boards on local level and the general synod on the national level. And in the, uh, on the diocesan level, it's, it's the dorm capital chaired by the bishop, which is more meaningful and more powerful because it's, it's kind of leading the spiritual life and, and the oversight in the, in the, in the uh, diocese as a whole. In the general synod, one third of members are elected by clergy, whereas two thirds are lay delegates elected by parish boards. That is mediated, not, not unmediated, not directly as it's in Sweden, as we heard. There's been a debate on this too in Finland. All bishops who are in active ministry are full members in the Senate. Well, this is again different from Sweden, where all, not all their bishops are in the Senate. And usually also they chair the various commissions of the Senate. There are no separate houses for lay and ordained. In fundamental issues or matters of doctrine, a qualified majority of three quarters is required. That is relatively high. Some Lutheran churches do not possess such a strong and secured presence of priests or bishops in their governing bodies. But for us, it is an elementary outcome of the article in the Lutheran Confessions. The Augsburg Confession from 1530 underlines the necessity of publicly ordained clergy in the church for proclaiming the word and administering the sacraments. Because of the centrality of public worship in the church, the ordained ministry occupies a seat or more in all governing bodies without diminishing the importance of lay presence in planning and deciding on the work of the church. It can be claimed that the emphasis on the priesthood of all baptized, so strongly supported by the reformer Martin Luther in his early tract to the Christian nobility of German nation from 1520, but somewhat less in his writings after the German peasants revolt in 1525. It, it paved way for a later development of European democratic ideals. Be it as it may, the common priesthood of all believers is often used as a motivation for synodal participation of laity in church governance among Lutherans, as we have heard already today. For example, the Church of Sweden, the church of Sweden has incorporated the principle of democracy in her constitution exactly on the basis that all baptized in Christ have a right to and responsibility of decision-making. Now, according to my understanding, uh, the priesthood of believers is a theological, not a juridical concept. Rather than a right to partake in governing the church, it grants a right to approach God in prayer, as well as a vocation to witness on Christ. St. Peter exhorts, exhorts in his first epistle, and I read the famous quote, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And St. Peter calls his readers a holy nation, God's own people. There is no necessary conclusion derived from the priesthood of all believers to an individual right to power in the church. As a matter of fact, it can be questioned whether the church is a democracy at all, since she is not a demos in the first place. She is not a people in a secular or political sense, 
She is a laos, a holy nation, a people of God. But let me use the word democracy without implying that the church were only a temporal society instituted by people and governed by human authority. No doubt, she nevertheless also is a human community and an institution in the world. There are similarities between the state and the church, rooted in the principle of democracy. If the people are expected to have responsibility on the economy of the church, they shall also have a right to be involved in the decision-making of it. In a democratic society of today, there can be no obligation to take part in financial support of a community without an opportunity to take part in its governance. This important principle cannot be neglected in any secular state, and no less in the church either. However, there is a flip side in this reasoning. Walking the way of Christ can hardly be equated with power. Power struggles in the church are alienating to many members for various reasons. In a folk church, like in Finland, where most citizens of a country are baptized members of one and same church, the majority do unfortunately not practice their membership by attending regularly. The same applies also to taking part in parish board elections or voting for a priest. In our latest parish elections last November, less than 13% of those eligible to vote used their right. 13. The members nevertheless finance the church by paying their church taxes and thus express their willingness, more or less, to be part of a religious community, albeit from a distance. Another consequence of democracy in a folk church is that anything that is under debate in the public arena will be discussed in the church as well. Listening closely to her members, the church shall always be exposed to all currents of thought in the society, be they philosophical or ideological. The church, aware of her own nature and mission, is invited to bring the gospel into an ongoing dialogue and interaction with her context. This is a dialogue that gradually shapes the culture and behavior both in the church as well as in the world. It is pastorally inevitable for the shepherds to walk with their flock and to know what kind of necessities of life they face. The people of God have their everyday problems as any other people, and the clergy need to remain with them, listen to them, and support them with counsel and prayer. In living out their faith, love, and hope, the baptized are in a constant dialogue and exchange with their own context. This shall inevitably also have a bearing on the decision-making in the church. Moving in my presentation from decision-making to mission, I also shift the emphasis from democratic ideals to the nature of the church as a witness of Christ. According to St. Paul, all Christians have received spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12. The Porvo Common Statement from 1992 reminds that there also needs to be a ministry of coordination to bring the diversity of gifts together. Following the, following the phrase in the Faith and Order paper, Baptism New Christian Ministry from 1981, Porvo describes the ministry of oversight to be a ministry of coordination exercised personally, collegially, and communally. This is a phrase repeated in many ecumenical papers, as we know. The communal or synodal exercises of oversight requires that the census fidei of the whole people of God is recognized through mutual listening and cooperation of the lay and ordained. The faith and order document on the church towards a common vision from 2013, situates Christ's authority in the interaction of the two. And I quote this, the church. Now this is a bit longer quote, sorry. The exercise of authority, 
includes the participation of the whole community whose sense of the faith, sensus fidei, contributes to the overall understanding of God's word and whose reception of the guidance and teaching of the ordained ministers testifies to the authenticity of that leadership. A relation of mutual love and dialogue unites those who exercise authority and those who are subject to it. End of quote. Synodal participation in mission also finds it its expression when the local parish members give a vocation to a new priest or when they take part in electing a bishop for their diocese. The number of lay electors in bishops' elections in Finland was rather limited until the end of the 20th century. Today in the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Finland, all ordained priests in the diocese and an equal number of lay electors from local parishes are eligible to vote for their bishop. Interestingly enough, it is the lay electors who are more active in using their right than the clergy, both in voting for members in the synod as for a bishop. Voting, however, it not, is not just an individual right to power. Its outcome represents the gathered voice of the church. Will it also always express the census fidelium is dependent at least to a sufficient discussion and prayer, not forgetting listening to the word of God. Coming back to the notion of the royal priesthood of all believers in the first epistle of St. Peter, I note that some commentators explain the Greek basileion hierateuma, sorry for my Finnish Greek, as a kingdom of priests, whereas others understand it as a priestly kingdom. To me, the former implies a compilation of individuals, but the latter is an integral body. So priestly kingdom or kingdom of priests. I think the priestly kingdom is better complies with the, with the concept of God's people in the Old Testament. Israel has a task peculiar to it, distinguished from all other peoples in the world. In the same manner, St. Peter calls his readers, I quote, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The people of God, the Laos, has a priestly task to proclaim the gospel of Christ. No member lacks a part to play in the mission of the whole body, claims the Lutheran Catholic study document, The Apostolicity of the Church, from 2006. The church is a community representing the reign of God in Christ through the promises given in the scriptures, made public in the proclamation of the gospel and works of love. To fill her vocation properly, the church needs to walk patiently together. Most of the walking together takes place in normal everyday life of the church, not in the meetings of synods. Everything that might be heavily debated in the synod can be a minor issue in a parish. In any case, such a thing is more a pastoral issue of living together and sharing the same faith than agitating opinions. For example, the question of marrying same-sex couples in church is constant, constantly under debate in the General Synod in Finland, and the Bishops' Conference continues working on it. However, many couples have simply been legally married by our, by our clergy, although without an authorized church formula. So they are acting as, as, as uh, how do you say, the, how do you call it, the, um, civil, civil servants. With, although without a decision by the General Synod, and they seem to have a legal right to that. There is a number of priests in same-sex marriages in our, in our dioceses, and there is no ban on ordination for anyone living in a same-sex relationship. In our local parishes, there are couples regularly attending worship together, and when I'm on a visitation in a parish, 
I can see these people are, that they are fully and lovingly included in the spiritual life of the church. In general, synodality is more a challenge for a witness on Christ than on our decision making. How do we encourage and equip our own members to a mission in their own context? Only by inviting and including them into different responsibilities and granting them opportunities for a priesthood of prayer and good example. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bishop Repo, for your precious reflections and also for mentioning your critical observations on Lutheran synodality in the variety of synodal, uh, synodality. So now there will be a break and I ask you to be back at six o'clock in this room. Okay, see you then. Thank you. Thank you. There's a lot of variety, isn't it? Yes. Yes. There's so lots of variety. Yeah. To, not to, Anglican communion. to present, <laughs> the, the Anglicans were very un, uh, yeah. Yeah. united. Yeah. Well, yes and no. Yes and no. Yes. Uh, you are kindly invited to go to the coffee because we have only 15 minutes so you can continue to, to talk during the coffee place.
Euh, Pierre Amidas. Ah, je peux le poser là-dessus oui, oui, oui. Ah bon Sans désastre. Comme vous voulez, merci. So if everybody is here, I would like to open the new session and giving the word to Professor Hervé Legrand for the response of the listener of the last panel. You will forgive me for the brevity and superficiality of my speech because I was only able to read the contribution of my colleagues after lunch. I will be also brief because I am not a native English speaking and you will have to put up with my strange French accent. Here are some lessons I learned. All of them are of practical nature. Since synodality is a practice, not a mindset. First, I appreciated the Lutheran critical reading of history, which teaches us Catholics that we must not have a romantic vision of synodality, because there will be a great distance between our important theological and pastoral expectation and the reality. The way to synodality is a great hope for Catholics, for us, but it will take much more time than we imagine. Second, this reform will requ require the Catholic Church to become truly Catholic, whereas it is too often a universal church. A term which in all European languages means uniformity, according to Aristotelian logic. In theory, we are Catholics, but as we don't not ignore, canon law ignores the term of Ecclesia Universalis. One find it nowhere there. Lumen Gentium also speaks of Ecclesial Universa, but this had been translated in French by universal, universal, as if, sorry. As also in Italian, where we read in the official uh, translation of, uh, of Lumen Gentium, Chiesa Universale. But this had been uh, in both languages and also in Spanish, uh, translated that way when the original text had universa, it means the entire church, and not universalis. So I did this all work. Sorry. I am a Dominican. You probably know the speech word in German, OP, ohne Praxis. <laughs> Therefore, 
we have to put into practice the Catholicity of the Church as communio ecclesiarum. For the communio ecclesiae is always such, as the Eastern churches in full communion with the Holy See show. Numerous reforms are needed. I mentioned some of them. Third point. One of the most urgent concerns is the appointment of bishops. At present, the Catholic bishops are in front of their church. The church has no, the local church has no say in the choice of persons appointed, with a few exceptions. They are nominated by the Pope alone since 1917. Eos, Libere, Nominat, Romanus, Pontifex, five words who uh, cut up the tradition at least present in the uh, canon law before that date. The Pope then can move them as he needs it. And nowadays, a Catholic bishop is much more in front, I say, of his church and less in his church. A big distance from Cyprian's motto, the people of God has the right to appoint worthy bishop and deposit unworthy. This should be changed, at least symbolically, according to our tradition, a real contrast with the present Lutheran practice, and Anglican also, of course. In his relationships to the diocesan synod, the situation of the bishop is identical. He is advised to convene it, but no periodicity is prescribed. He is master of the agenda, and only what he promulgates has force of law. But he then promulgates the decision without changes, as is true. If we hold to our tradition, in which the bishop represents all the faithful of his church, there is room for reform without asking for representation of the laity in the synods of bishops to the pope where they have no place or church cannot be democratic, as Bishop Ripo reminded us. First point, I retain a question. At what level to situate the regional churches? in a future scene. From the history of the Lutheran churches, from the principle of sumus episcopus exercised by the princes, and from the national character of the churches, even from the German synods, which accepted the Aryan paragraph, I believe that we must avoid the national level in the 21st century. Religion and nation, even ethnicity, are still linked before our eyes in Ukraine and also in Muslim countries, in India, and in other parts of the world. Fifth point. Finally, I retain a last and very great lesson from the dialogue with the Lutherans, who are remarkable theologians who allowed the Augsburg Agreement on Justification. May I remain that we agreed there that with words that are not identical, dank formen that are not the same, and different accents, we can say the same thing, die Sache selbst. This epistemology in the interpretation of dogmas signed by both churches is a great opening for Catholic theology and perhaps also for Lutherans, as Dr. Lang outlined, outlined it. I conclude from this that Lutheran sinners always made a great space for theological professors, while they have hardly any room in our synods and are hardly consulted by the magisterium. Of course, I learned much more from our Lutheran partners today. 
uh, learn more as a member of the international dialogue, of course. I hope, above all, that our Catholic Church should be a listening church to our consultations. Thank you for your patience. Thank you so much, Professor Le Grand. So we have quite half an hour for discussion of this last panel, Lutheran views on synodality. Please give us your question. Okay. My name is Nicolas Stark. Um, I'm a student um, and especially Lutheran Jew, um, student from Germany. And um, I was wondering um, how the uh, LWF is operating, especially um, with churches or national churches that are mostly or kind of uh, different churches. I'm having in, um, in mind this um, declaration of the Church Eucharist and Ministry, the Communion and Growth from 2017, and um, then the, uh, the German answer from 2019. Um, I don't know if you are in uh, common with that. It's um, how the, the Finnish church um, is, um, or when you read it, you can, it seems like the, um, Finnish Lutheran Church is really different uh, from the German Lutheran Church. And I'm wondering how the LWF is operating in this consens. Uh, <clears throat> that's a, a very uh, good question, um, <laughs> which, which um, I think we all are are struggling uh, with, and which Anna Burkhardt referred to at the end of her, com uh, her intervention concerning mutual accountability. Uh, there is a process that we are beginning to engage in trying to understand how do we uh, come together as a communion uh, that respects also the differences, the diversity within uh, the communion. Uh, that's a process we're engaging now. It, it revolves around the question for Lutherans. It's an internal question. What do we mean by a communion of churches? Uh, we have, of course, across the LWF altar and uh, pulpit and altar fellowship, but uh, the decisions that one church may make impacts um, today and this global world impacts other churches as well. And how do the question is how do we um, nurture a deeper sense of, of attention or, if you will, of listening to one another to discern a way together? Uh, can we, in our theological reflection, take seriously this bearing of one another's burdens. It's, a, of course, a beautiful theological description uh, in the Paul's letter to the Galatians of what it means um, to live out faith, but how does that happen on the ecclesial uh, level is an ongoing, an ongoing question. Uh, one way, uh, just very practically, that we have tried to engage that ecumenically in our ecumenical work. Uh, for example, in our dialogue with the Roman Catholic Church, uh, we have been attentive in um, forming uh, our, or inviting theologians from the Lutheran side who represent different streams of Lutheranism. Uh, so on the preparatory group uh, that is looking at uh, the defining some of the questions for the sixth uh, phase of the Lutheran-Roman Catholic dialogue, we have exactly 
a Finnish theologian, a German theologian, and a North American theologian who all come with very different perspectives on what ministry is uh, and to some degree what ecclesiology is as it's lived out in their particular churches. Uh, so we already, in our ecumenical dialogue, bring together these theologians, Lutheran theologians, to get them to discuss uh, together as, as, as well. I mean, that's just a very practical example of how we try to encourage an, an ethos of listening uh, to one another. Um. Uh, thank you. Um, I, every time I meet with our Lutheran brothers and sisters, uh, there's a, a lot of experience that we can draw from. And in, in my own studies, there is a, a very important figure that I encountered, Hans Domboise, um, in his famous work on the, the right of grace. And I thought I would have heard the foundation of, of uh, uh, canon law uh, in that relationship, since Anne had spoken so much about the spiritual dimension, that that would have been something that um, would have been uh, really important. And as uh, Father Legrand has said, the question of practice, uh, because Domboise in his work confronts both the theory and the practice together of living as a church based on the sacramental life of the church. So uh, maybe um, you could speak something to that. And the, the other observation I would make that, that she had, Anne had mentioned several times, and this would go to the, the pastoral aspect of uh, the synodical form, um, is a catechesis. Because I think our problem in the Catholic Church is that we don't form our laity to take the responsibility of living their baptism in active ways within the church which includes uh, making decisions and uh, supporting the, the task of bringing the gospel forward. So uh, it would be very interesting to hear from you about the role of catechesis in the formation of the laity who are called, therefore, to participate in a synodical structure of the church. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, my emphasis was different. <laughs> so I... Um, I, I chose um, more to look at the, the contemporary diversity of the um, kind of legal setup of the churches. So um, to be very frank, because I think the challenge is there, uh, the challenge is there of how these different systems uh, communicate with one another. Um, so this is why, why I chose that. Um, if I may, in another way, also respond to your second question, and then others can come in at, uh, as well. I think one of the other challenges that I've not yet mentioned is um, do we, what kind of people are actually um, gathered in the Synod? I mean, who gets to represent? And our um, Anglican colleagues have already mentioned that it is quite uh, time consuming. I mean, there are very practical challenges. Um, and um, there, there's a certain kind of kinds of people that then um, stand um, to be elected in synods. And how can we equip so that we have a broader diversity uh, within the synod? And I think this is, this is a real challenge. Um, educating them, empowering them in the best uh, sense so that we have uh, the re really uh, more representative synods. And I think we Lutherans do have a challenge there. So. Yes, thank you for the question re uh, regarding the catechism or the catechesis. catechesis. Now, uh, it is helpful for us Lutherans that, that our catechism is, is really small. It's based on Martin Luther's small catechism. And the, 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 the catechism we use today in our confirmation training in Finland is, is based on Luther's small catechism. And it only has this these five, uh, five uh, central capitals that, that the, 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 the Ten Commandments and the Credo and the, and the uh, Lord's Prayer and then the sacraments. So com compared to, for example, the, the catechism of the Catholic Church, which is very, very thick, like, more, more like a canon law for the laity. <laughs> it's, it, and, sorry. Uh, the small catechism, 
we have a modernized version of it uh, uh, and uh, made for, uh, for, the, for the context of the 2000s, of, of year 2000, and, and used in our confirmation training. And, but the problem is that, that it only appears in the life of those attending confirmation training. That is, the youth in their 15th, uh, who are 15 of age. And uh, well, confirmation training is very popular in Finland. Also, also, youngsters from families that are not members in the church want to come to our confirmation camps because this training is, takes take place in, in, in the summer on a one-week camp. And about 80% of all 15 ages attend our confirmation training. Very good, okay. And many of them will want to come next summer again and be as big sisters or big brothers for the, for the new group. But after two or three years, we seem to lose them. So, so uh, when they turn 18, 19, 20, when they move to another place, they, they ask themselves, why should I be a member of the church? Because the faith plays no role in my life, and, and the, the, the church plays no role in my life. And the friendly atheists have put up a service in the internet where you can get, get rid of the church just by one mouse click, and, and you're out. And, and many of our young adults forget very quickly what they learned at the confirmation school. And how can we reach out to these, these young people? It's really a challenge. And, and many, many people in their 30s and 40s and, and 50s, they start rethinking their life. And that is where we should also go back to the catechism, to go to the catechesis. And that is really a challenge for us. I'm Bohumil Petrik. I'm the journalist from Slovakia, ex Czechoslovakia, here in Rome. And um, my question, or set of questions, is that is there a limit to synodality? And specifically to Bishop Repo, you said that some Lutheran churches um, have a bishop, others do not. Uh, what are you referring to? Some national. Lutheran bishops or churches, could you just please clarify that? And that some of them can be characterized as episcopally led, democratically governed. But others, how would you define their um, synodal process, whatever? And you also said that um, um, all baptized are basically invited to be decision makers. But I mean, equally? Everyone has the same uh, decision-making uh, function, power, call. Mm, I don't know what other word I should I use. So. Thank you. Uh, yes, that is true that not all Lutheran churches do have bishops, but they nevertheless have ministries of oversight. They, they, and they might be called presidents or, or, or general superintendents or, or whatever. And they exercise, they exercise oversight and in that sense that they have a responsibility of several local parishes, just like we as bishops do have. They only do not have the same title and they may not be, they may not be consecrated to, 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 or ordained as bishops, but they have, in, in some way they are installed as bishops and, and, and entrusted some kind of responsibility. So, so episcopacy in this sense is, is something that unites all churches. Now, and I, I'm pretty much con convinced that these churches also do have synodal uh, elements in their governance, that they, in, that they include the, uh, the church members also in their decision-making bodies. Uh, yeah, in principle, all the members in the church should have a, a, an opportunity to, to take part in the, in the decision-making, but of course not all can do it, and not all will do it, and, and not all do want to do it. But, so that's why we come to the mediated or, or delegated decision making, so that, that these people are, are elected by the, the church members some, in some sense. There was a dis debate some 25 years ago in the Church of Finland whether we should continue requiring that, to require that they, they have to be not only baptized members, but also confirmed members. And there was quite a debate in the General Synod on that, and, 
And it is concerned that, that the baptism as, as such, if, 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 we, if we take seriously the understanding of, 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 of the priesthood of all baptized people, then, then the baptism should be enough. And, and, and so the confirmation was removed as a requirement. But I, it, it might be that some churches, Lutheran churches, still do require also confirmation, that, that you, in a way you show that you are interested in it and you, you have also given some vows in a confirmation that, that you will be executing your faith. So there are, there are some, or exercising your faith. So there are differences in Lutheran churches here. A limit to synodality. Uh, well, this, is, this is it, as I, as I, as I see it. So what I said about the church as a democracy doesn't mean that, that uh, the church applies democratic principles, but it's not a democ democracy in that sense, that, that all people should be there making decisions, just like in, a, in, a, in, a, in any state, in a parliament, not all, not all people are present, but only those that are delegated there. What, what would be the limit, limit to it? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, whether it is that in some issues should not be synodical decisions or whether uh, the limit is, is concerning yeah, some other. In general, thing. like, can we be synodal in, in a doctrine? Or you mentioned the same sex uh, marriage uh, no, pairs are ordained, though they did not have authorization. So, mm -hmm. like, okay, they can do whatever they want. Uh, there are synodal in a way. So, this is what I'm referring to, whether yeah. synodality can be applied to whatever uh, means this democratization or... I really am trying to find the, the correct words to, to really understand, like, when can we go as far as... Um, I don't know, when it comes to not just um, the process of pastoral life, but also, like, really hard issues. Uh, Doc doctrine, we would call doctrine, or magisterium. I, again, is this yes. now clear? A yes, bit this more? Is, that, that's true. This is a, really a debated question because uh, uh, and in, in order to, for the church to decide on same-sex marriages would mean that there would need to be a formula in the church agenda for that. And that should be decided with a qualified majority of three quarters. And the issue comes up Quite, quite regularly in the in the uh, general synod, but it, it's hard to reach this this qualified majority of three quarters, and the three quarters requirement means that the church would be sufficiently unanimous on this issue, even though it would not, not reach totally unanimity. It would need to to reach the uh, a, a sufficient unanimity on it, and uh, so the. Uh, all these issues really come up to the, to the general synod where the uh, clergy and, and, the, uh, and the lay representatives are together taking decisions on it. So uh, I, I don't see where the, in that sense the, sin, the limit would be. But, but, the, but this, it, it is an, a doctrinal issue, that, that is true. But some issues are given to the bishop's conference then to give further advice on how do we, how do we go on with our... our, our divisive issues. <laughs> I would just <clears throat> add one, one thing uh, to, to your response. The question of limits of synodality, I think, in a way treats or understands perhaps synodality as primarily a decision-making process, a, perhaps a juridical process, whereas synodality, I think, invites into a reflection both spiritual and on and juridical where power structures themselves are reconfigured are we can we dare in a process of discernment to rethink the relationship between uh, we've talked about episcopacy um, and about the universal priesthood, is there a way of defining that, or, or ordained ministry and universal priesthood, is there a way of defining that differently than we have classically done? Is there a way of moving out of some of our definitions of authority and power 
uh, to, uh, based on an understanding of baptism that would then see synodality not only as who can make what decisions. Hello. I'm Dimitrios Kieramidas, Greek Orthodox. So uh, thank you for your presentations. I have a question first for Professor Sin. So if I understood correctly, in the Lutheran churches, or at least in some of them, the decision-making process is the same with the decision-taking process. So if it is a case, uh, if the subject that makes decisions is the same that takes decisions, then what is the, uh, the, the, um, the binding force of decisions? So if the same subject makes decisions and takes decisions, there is no reception process that case. Uh, so what does it mean this for the decisions, for the, uh, for the value, canonical value of decisions, or the authority of decisions? Or can these decisions be changed? Uh, that is my question then to Professor Lange. Uh, if I understood correctly, um, reading your paper, uh, there is a tension, tension in the Lutheran world uh, um, regarding the, the synodal nature of the church and the hierarchical structure of the church. I realize that even in the Orthodox Church there are, si there are similar discussions concerning whether hierarchies uh, belong to the nature of the church or not. Um, uh, according to a certain Orthodox understanding, uh, there shouldn't be any, any, any tension between the synodical and the hierarchical expression of the church, because they're both part of the Eucharistic uh, expression of the church, nature of the church. According to Metropolitan Zizulas, there are two orders in the church, the laity and the clergy. The laity takes its place in the Eucharist, is being ordained to be part of the order in the church, because in the church we have order and not disorder. So could this be perhaps uh, something that uh, the Lutheran Church could reflect on. And for Bishop uh, Repo, uh, in, uh, recently there was, uh, in the Church of Cyprus, uh, the case of the election of the new Archbishop. The case the, of the Church of Cyprus is uh, a rare case in the Orthodox world where also laity exercise the right to, uh, to vote for, for some names uh, to become bishops, and only 30% of the faithful exercise their, their right. So there are similar problems even in the Orthodox uh, Church. But what is the, the, the static of episcopacy, of the Episcopal Office Ministry in the Lutheran Church, if uh, the decision-making uh, process, turning back to the argument, uh, the body that makes decisions uh, uh, includes the whole baptized. So in this case, does the, the bishop loses his representative authority? Does he represents the church or not? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for the question. Actually, to be honest, this distinction between decision making and decision taking is not a big conversation within Lutheranism, in, to my knowledge. Um, so it's more kind of, I'm actually responding to some conversations that I heard from Catholic friends that this is currently uh, something that is uh, um, in discernment, so to say, in, in the Catholic Church. In the Lutheran Church, we uh, say that the Synod uh, discerns, dis debates, discusses, and then comes to a decision and takes this decision. Now, then this takes the form of a regulation or a law, um, and then this law is then implemented, so to say, by the respective authorities. The respective authorities can be the Ministry of Oversight, meaning the bishop or the jurists or whatever. So, but, but the whole process in the Synod is, is one coherent process. It's not just that the Synod would consult, would be consulted and then somebody else decides. So I, I wanted to emphasize the one coherent uh, process that we have. And it's just to say that it's not a debate that we uh, currently have because it, to us, our processes seem coherent.
thank you. <laughs> thank you for the question. And I believe in some senses, in some sense, uh, my response earlier to the question about the limits of synodality is a beginning of a response uh, uh, to your question, but only a beginning. And I, and I hear the challenge in it. Uh, as, as we look at, or as we theologically reflect on synodality as this um, both spiritual and political uh, reality, then the, the relationship between laity and clergy uh, is seeking a new language, is seeking a, a reconfigured uh, dynamic. Uh, uh, perhaps here we need to look at our traditions, our conf Lutherans at their confessions, to see how uh, that has been defined and whether um, the Eucharistic fellowship uh, offers, and I think from a Lutheran perspective, would offer then that possibility of redefining uh, that relationship, um, especially when we look back um, at, at the early, early Luther, uh, the Eucharist understood, not in a polemical sense, but as, uh, as he says, truly a communion uh, that is continually breaking open the community uh, to, to others, then uh, I think there is a possibility for us uh, around the Eucharistic table to also find a means of redefining that relationship of laity and clergy. But again, I think it's moving past certain cultural definitions of hierarchy or power that is required uh, of us. Thank you for the question on, on, on the authority of the bishops might have in the, in the general synod. Now, as I, as I mentioned earlier, in the Church of Finland, all bishops are ex official full members in the General Synod, whereas in the Church of Sweden, not all bishops are in the General Synod, only, only a few bishops. But then again, the Church of Sweden General Synod has a doctrinal com committee, commission, La Runemt, and uh, all bishops are present in, that, in this doctrinal commission. And all issues that are doctrinal go into this La Runemt. And, uh, and the bishops have to agree that, and, and the bishops uh, give their, give their uh, opinion on that, from, from that. And uh, if the General Synod nevertheless wants to vote against, to be, to, to be against this opinion of the Laron end, then the bishops have a right to veto. Now that is Sweden. Whereas in Finland, we don't have such a Laron end, but we all are present in the, in the General Synod. And, uh, and when it comes to doctrinal issues, a qualified majority of three quarters is required. And uh, th that means that it's very seldom that, that, that we would face such a, such a situation where the, uh, where, the, where the bishops would be totally against it and, and their authority would be kind of at stake. But, but I also want to refer, come back to what I was quoting from the faith and order document on, on the church towards a common understanding. What it said about the authority, that, that the authority is, is not something embedded only in one ministry, but it's in the, in the church as a whole, and it can be recognized in the interaction of, the, of, the, uh, of those in the episcopacy and, and those, in the mem those members in the church, and, and they are in, in constant interaction. And, that, and, and then also the bishops learn from the from the church members. Thank you for all the questions, for the responses, and for your attention. When I look at the timetable, we should finish our session now and conclude this day with an evening prayer. So I ask you to take out this paper you might have and to stand for the prayer.
Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our faith together with the words of the Apostolic Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From hence he will come to judge living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Heaven Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And do not hurt in temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, from ever and ever. Amen. Let us pray together with the words of Martin Luther's prayer, evening prayer. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I command myself, my body, my soul, and so things, let your holy angel be with me, and the evil from my know-how power of me. Amen. Have a blessed evening and a blessed night. Thank you. So, the evening meal will serve also in the in Sala Colonne. When we were having, you are most welcome to, to join. Tomorrow we will have, uh, we will start at nine by listening to the reform approach.